Today is March 18, 1997. My name is Susan Perez, P-E-I-R-E-Z. Today I'm conducting an interview with Simone Leapster, Ney Arnold, in Brooklyn, New York, United States of America, and the language being spoken is English. What is your name? My name is Simone Arnold. I was born in Alsace-Lorraine. Um, my mother, uh, my mother's name was Emma Bourtout. My father was Adolf Arnold. They married in a valley in the mountains uh, called Vosges. My father was an artist and he was working in a print tree to make designs for flowers. And uh, they lived there. I was born in 1930, 17th August, after seven years of marriage. And then we moved down to Mulhouse, which is the bigger city uh, where the uh, larger printing plants. What's uh, the name of the, the town you were born? Mulhouse. No, the town and, you were born. Uh, uh, where I was born. It isn't a town. It is a very, very little village. You will have a hard time to find it on a map. It's husseren Vesserlin. And um, it is connected with a printing plant, really. It was more like a factory, and houses were around the factory, you see. Uh, so while father was working in that factory to make the designs for the printing, we were living, uh, so to say, uh, inside the factory walls. Where is this factory located? Well, it is in uh, Alsace. It is in, uh, in the mountains. It's a valley which is called uh, the Tan Valley. And uh, the business was called Roman, uh, the printing plant. It was working especially for England, making... Uh, printing material for uh, the King's House in England. And it closed down uh, in '33, and my father was invited to become an, an art counselor in another printing plant. So we moved to Mulhouse, which is a large city, industrious city. It is a city, in, uh, it's an old city in the centrum, is a very old city but they had a lot of factories over there. For instance, uh, some, uh, some factories are well known. It's uh, a DMC thread factory. I even in the States could uh, buy some of their uh, material here, you see. It's a well world known place. So was the factory where my father was working, Schaefer. Uh, it still exists and still does a uh, lot of printing for all Europe. So uh, my childhood was uh, in between country life and city life, which made it a very rich life because in the country, my grandparents, is, uh, on mother's side, on father's side, they had died. But on mother's side, were living in the mountains. They had a farm, and I worked a lot there. And uh, I loved very much the animals over there. They made me always so happy when we went there. But at home, uh, life was quite different. Father being an artist, uh, you know, making paintings. How was that different? Well, uh, the different setting of the house was, the, uh, you know, at my grandparents it was country life. At home it was more intellectual. Uh, father loved uh, to study about astronomy. And uh, he liked geography. He could tell you any geography about Asia, Africa, or South America. He knew everything by heart. And he would share, you know. Our evenings at home, he would have the big book on the lap, the dog on his feet, and he would uh, go through the map. And while mother was knitting, and me playing on a corner, you know, he just went on and say, you see, this is here, and uh, here the weather is like that, and <clears throat> all this. And um, this moon or this uh, satellite is over here or this uh, uh, star over there. You know, he would go through the material. He was sharing always what he read. We were very strong Catholics. We would go to church on Sunday morning. But Father believed more on the way of life, living religion, not, uh, I should say, traditional way, but having religious principles in life. And in 1937, my mother got a Bible. Now, in those days, the Bible was not permitted for a Catholic to be read. So when the Bible came in the house, uh, 
big discussion happened on the table between my father and my mother about what they read in the Bible. Before that event happened, do you remember the first time you went to church, Catholic church, the very first? No, I don't remember because they took me along as baby already, baby girl. I only can tell you that the church was very important for me. No, just to tell you how that happened, mother had been aware of a problem with a priest, a sexual problem with a boy. She actually met the, both of them in, uh, outside in the greens, you see, by walking. They were just happening to, to meet. So from that day on, Mother said, I do not want to see you in church alone. You, you mean see? your mother saw this priest and this yes. young boy yes. in a sexual sense? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Did she confront them? Or? No. She ran away because I was not far away, you know. And so uh, she didn't tell me why, of course. She just said, I do not want to see you alone in the church. No, I was six years old then, and I said, my mother has no right to interfere between God and me. So I did go to church, but I didn't stay there, you know. I went in the door, passed, went out on the other door. The school was on the other side. But I had the feeling to keep the contact with God, you know. So uh, sort of a compromise because Mother said, you do not go in. And I said, no, I don't go in. I walk through, you see. Well, that's the way I felt about religion. And, well, when the Bible, as I told you, the Bible came on, uh, I listened to all those Bible conversations. And I remember Father was very much touched by a scripture which stands in in one of the letters of the Apostle John where he says that uh, a Christian would be known by the way he loves his neighbor. If not, a manslayer was from the beginning Satan, the devil, and whoever is like a manslayer, like Cain, could not be a Christian. No, this came deeply into my heart, and I felt that I would like to be as close as possible to the model who was Christ. Now, my parents never told me what I should do uh, because they believed in freedom of conscience. They just were talking between themselves, and my mother would do every morning Bible reading before I went to school. Every when did morning, that start? What year did that start? The uh, 37. I was seven years old, and I would go to school, you know, bubbling over what I had learned in my Gospels or whatever, you know, I like to share. And so we had a, a, an intellectual uh, family life, very happily so. And in 1938, we got a book from Switzerland, which is called Christendom. Uh, uh, no, let me see now, crusade against Christendom. And it gathered material from concentration camps in Germany about Jehovah Witnesses already in 1938. It was published by Mr. Zürcher in uh, Bern. And it gave details. It, it even had plans of the camp the procedures the Gestapo had on Jehovah Witnesses. It was a very clear statement about concentration camp life before the war, because the witnesses were the first one to be arrested with the communists already back in 33, 34. So by the time of 37, 38, they had gathered material and sneaked it out to, uh, to the Swiss border, you know, and had it published. Now, as of 1937, you're seven years old, did you yes. know about Hitler? Yes. When did you first remember hearing his name as a young girl? Well, approximately in this, uh, through that book in 1937, 38. So up see? until 37, you didn't know who Hitler was? Uh, not specifically. Maybe uh, my father would have spoken, but uh, I didn't give him too much attention about uh, things like that, you know. I remember when uh, uh, the German took over Austria, I remember my father said, this is not a good sign for us, Alsatian. Because 
Alsace is a country alongside the Rhine River in the north of Switzerland. It goes up to Luxembourg. And it is a German dialect speaking part of France. So when Hitler got Austria on the other side, my father said, this man is also going to get Alsace back, which had been German before 1914, you see, that part. My, f my parents went to a German school. They were born in 1997 and 1998. And 18. Yes, 18, yeah, of course. <laughs> and uh, uh, they went to German school because that part of the country was German until 1914. See? It was French before 1870. Then it became German again. Then it became French again, you see. Then it became German again. It's a back and forth. So what language did you speak at home? It's a uh, dialect. Alsatian dialect. It's a German dialect, really. Uh, it's older than the German language. It has been there before. German has been uh, created later. In Luther's time, you see, with Goethe, the German came on. So anyhow, in 37, 38, when, when, 38, when Hitler took uh, Austria, my father said, uh, this is not good for us. He might get us back too, you see. And then when came along Poland, he said for sure he's going to run over our country. Now something that made father so sure about it is that in those days some newspapers were printed in French and German. And the Catholic newspapers were putting German very high. Not Hitler. They wouldn't speak about Hitler. They were in France, you know. But they, were, they would keep up the German nationality, the pride to be Germans, you see. So my father said, this is going to wind up that Alsace would go back to Germany. We, we could feel that. Now, when I started off talking about the Bible in school, that was the same time, you see, the same year. When did you start school? 1936. It was the same year, you see, same time when it started off with Austria. Parallel to that, I was t uh, talking about the Bible reading. And it is so much different from what the uh, Catholic taught, you know, in, uh, their priest taught. So the children would get at me, and they would call me dirty Jew. Because there was no worse way, you know, to express hatred than to use that expression, dirty Jew. But it did not have, uh, uh, it didn't crush on me. It made me proud, because for me, the Jews were God's people, Abraham's seed. And I thought it was an honor to be compared to a Jew. So I never felt this as being a load on me, you see. From the very first time that you went to school, you were called a dirty Jew? or As soon as we stopped going to the church. And this uh, was in seven years old, 37. So 38. when you first went to school, who were your friends? My friends uh, were Catholics. Almost no protest, maybe one or two in the class. And that's it. Uh, when I got to start talking about the Bible, they associated me to the worst kind of people on earth. For a Catholic used to be a Jew, because that's the way they were teaching, they were taught. The Catholic Church always claimed uh, that they killed God, while well, Jesus never was God. Uh, this is completely against what the Bible says. The Catholic Church has made out of Jesus the God. And they said the Jews have killed God. This is nonsense because you cannot kill God anyhow. But the hatred comes from way back to the centuries, you know. And my father, who has read a lot of books and always shared everything, I knew the background of the hatred against the Jews. I knew where it came from. And I knew also that it comes from 
a source which is not in the Bible. It's outside. It's their opinion. The Bible never has pushed the responsibility of Jesus' death on all the Jews. That, that doesn't fit into the Bible, you see. So when they called me dirty Jew, I didn't feel uh, humiliated because I thought, well, uh, to a certain extent, we as Jehovah Witnesses, we continue the, the same way of thinking like the Jews did. Were there any Jews in your class? Yes, in this time, and then they started to move out. How many Jews in your school? Friends. About two or three. Uh, they were not in my class, they were in my school. Uh, it was a short, uh, uh, few members of the community. Did you ever talk to them? Uh, not exactly because they were not in my class. You see, they were in my school, but not, in, not the same age. So, this is the setting in 1937, 38, you know, and then my father, my mother, they would speak about that book, about the persecution of Jehovah's Witnesses in Germany, you know. Before your parents began to convert to Jehovah's mm -hmm. Witnesses, had you ever known a Jehovah's Witness? Had you ever no. seen Bibelforshers? No, or? no, no. We were practically worth of, uh, well, there was a group of about 40 for a whole department, you know. And my mother got three booklets from one of Jehovah's Witnesses who traveled to the country came, coming from Switzerland. And she never saw him again afterwards, you know, after they did their own Bible studies until they found the group. So they found the group. I was about eight years old or nine when we got to get to some meetings of other witnesses there. And by this time, we had a very clear understanding of what would happen to us when the German would take over, you see. So we expected it and we got ready for that. Now what does that mean? Well, we knew that the Germans had put a ban on Jehovah's Witnesses in Germany. You could get arrested if you had a single little booklet of Jehovah's Witnesses, you go to camp. When you had the Elberfeld Bible, which has the name Jehovah in there, they call this a Jewish Bible. The person who had that Bible could be arrested with no trial whatsoever. Did you witness any, anybody, did you see anybody who, who was arrested in your town? Well, time? my own parents. Before then? Before no, the, he was the first one. My father was the first one to be arrested. And the other ones, uh, well, I wasn't there when they were arrested, you know, in, in the same week. Uh, five of them got arrested, you know, it was a quick act from the Gestapo. But uh, the French government put Jehovah Witnesses on ban before the Germans came. And the police said, you move out of your hall and you take everything away. Uh, if you don't do it, we have to do it in two, three days' time. So they gave us freedom to move our things ourselves, you see. They were soft on us, they were good-hearted. But from that day on, we went underground. We had our meetings underground, and we got our watchtowers and the material to study the Bible underground. And my father organized this underground work over the border. And with my parents, I did go once in a while on that underground part to get material to come over the border. The French material had to be translated into German and copied and sent to Germany. So as soon as the Germans came there, we were already organized. Now, when the, as soon as the, friend, as the German came into France, remember, they came over Belgium, Belgium, over Paris, before they came to my country. They came from the back, not from the Rhine River. I was at my grandma's place. My mother had sent me over there because she was afraid that in the city we wouldn't have any food. So she said, you go to the farm. And from my grandmother's place, you could see all the churches in the valley. You know, in France, the villages are very tight in, and churches in the middle, and uh, the city town is next to it, you know. And I was standing on that rock, and I looked in the valley, and 
Oh, wow. I saw on the city hall the French flag, blue, white, red, and on all churches, all of them, the swastika. Before the Germans ever came to the place, as soon as Paris was overtaken over, all the churches got the swastika out. And I just couldn't believe it, you know, because you don't make a swastika flag in the night. It's a complicated thing, you know, round and all the designs. So it was ready, just like there. So we knew that when the Germans come, they wouldn't have a hard time to take everything over. That was it. When they came, the first thing they demanded is that you do not speak a single word of French. If you spoke only one word of French, you could go six weeks in a concentration camp. They opened one in Alsace, which is called Schirmeck, and this was used f only to get the Alsatian straightened out. People would go there for six weeks. They would come home, would have lost about 20 pounds. It was told to them, no, you listen. If you tell to anyone what you have seen in this camp, we get you back and put you in a true concentration camp where you won't come out anymore. So those people who have been there because they maybe have used a French word or maybe have criticized Hitler or, you know, little things like that. Did you that. know anyone who went to that? Oh, yes, in the street we had several ones like that. And had, did you know then what was happening in, in Schirmack? No, because those people wouldn't speak. When they came out, they were so scared, they just would get out of your way. As soon as one would come up to you, he would disappear when he saw you, you know? Too afraid you might ask a question, and he could be, again, uh, denunciated, you know? So this was getting a heavy feeling about the country. So the Germans got organized, you know, their way of thinking. We in school, we, we got Hitler uh, uh, teachings, you know. Now something I would like to share with you is how the Germans, uh, well, I shouldn't say the Germans, the Nazis, uh, I want to make the difference, it's not all the Germans. The Nazis were teaching evolution. And they used that evolution to create their theory, because in evolution, it's the strongest one that comes over the weakest one. That's t uh, the evolution, right? So they said, all right, in the beginning, mankind was on a very low level. And some have made efforts and efforts and efforts and efforts and have come up as Aryans. And the other ones haven't made those efforts. So they stayed on a lower level. The Untermenschen, they called them, huh? the lower class, you see. And now they went on and said, no, you are children of Aryans. You have your ancestors who made all that work that you come up to a higher level. So you have to be thankful to what your parents and grandparents, but you have the responsibility to give what you got over to your children and grandchildren. So, in order to keep this Aryan life getting up, you have to fight against anything which comes across and doesn't permit this Aryan life to grow. Everyone who is not with us is against us. Everyone who doesn't go with it has to disappear. Now this I heard over and over and over again in school, you see. And they said, the Untermenschen, the other ones who did not grow, they're like wheat. They have too much children. They grow too fast. The Aryans have a hard time, you see, because they want to be perfect and better. So uh, they have a hard time to go on. So we have to make solid boundaries. 
to keep the other ones out so the Aryans can take over for the good of the world. Now, this is the Nazi schooling I got through, you see. Now, I had a Bible schooling at home. And in the Bible, you have compassion that does not exist with Nazis. You have forgiveness that does not exist with Nazism, you see. You have all those qualities which do not exist in Nazism. So I could find out by myself that I never could get with that ideology. Even so, my parents wouldn't tell me, do this or do that. I had a sufficient understanding how wrong it was to go along Nazism. So on the 4th September 1941, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, the bell rang. It was a time my father would come home from work. Usually my mother had the door open. And I said to my mother, hi. You didn't unlock the door. And I jumped, you know, toward the door, opened the door, jumped on my father's neck to kiss him. And suddenly behind him, somebody said, Heil Hitler. And when I looked on the man I had kissed, it was a Gestapo. I fell down on my feet, icy cold, you know. Pushed me aside and said, where is your mother? I said, she's here. You go in your room. So I went in my room and I said, how does that man know I have a personal room? Many children, when they are small, share rooms, you know, especially in those days. I said, funny. So they had mother on a cross examination for four hours. They wanted to get the names of all the witnesses, and they wanted to get to know the underground activity, which I mentioned before, you see. I was sitting in my room, and then suddenly I saw on a shelf the Elberfeld Bible with the name Jehovah. And I said, oh, we are going to get arrested if they find this Bible. So I went up and said to my mother, I have to buy a book. And the Gestapo said, all right, two minutes and you will be back because the shop is only on the corner of the road. So I ran out with that Bible and was hiding that Bible under the tomatoes of our neighbor so that it got out of the place, you see. When I came back, I checked on Father's bicycle, and it was there. And I said, oh, Father has come back. We are saved. This bicycle uh, was for me the assurance that Dad was home. And, uh, you know, my father being home, I thought we are saved. Uh, it, it just couldn't be possible that anything would happen. I was still a child. I was not quite 11, you know, when it ha just 11 when it happened. So I ran up, and Mother was alone with the Gestapo. So again, I got that cold, that freezing cold over me, and I said, something has gone wrong with my father, and we are lost. Well, the Gestapo was going back and forth. They were handling the situation that way. Uh, one would ask a question. I could see the place because there was a mirror, and from my room I could see the mirror, you see. One was sitting in one corner, and he would ask a question to mother, and the other one would write down the answer, and when he saw a sort of a hesitation, you know, not, not a quick answer, he would get back on the question a few moments later. So uh, i just give you an example, uh, the one uh, that really gave me a lesson. The day before this interview, one of Jehovah's Witness with the name of Adolf Köhl, which was a very close friend of ours, had come to our home for some contact, I don't know what, anyhow. Now, the Gestapo, that 4th September, said to my mother, yesterday a man was at your place. Yes, she said. His name. Mother said, no, listen. If tomorrow somebody is asking me if I had visitors, two men, I will say yes. 
But did I ask you your name when you came into my place? So this is the type of way my mother was handling the whole afternoon. They never could get any word out of her. And it was never a, a, a no. A, 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 I mean, a, it was not a face-to-face, -face, you know. Mother was the type of person that had feelings. She had blue eyes, you know, they're just pursing through when she looked at people. But she uh, uh, she was smart, she was fine, you know, she had uh, something in her, and they couldn't get anything out of her. So they had big books, you know, where they wrote all the answers in, and slapped them, you know, and they got up and one of them said, if you want to see your husband, he's in our hands. And you and your child, you are going the same way. We are going to get you. They went down the two stairs, and when they are on the street, you just imagine no car, nothing except police cars in those days. And there everybody knew something was going on, you know. So people were on the windows around. And there the Gestapo was on the, uh, near the car, and they showed it on, uh, on the house, you won't see your husband anymore, never. And mother was there and calmly said, this does not depend on you, this depends on God. And in the future I will see him. So they left. And during six weeks my mother would go to the prison get father's uh, underwear to wash, bring it back, no letter, no contact, didn't know what happened. It was a blackout completely. But we knew how they were handling with the Jehovah's Witnesses, you know. We knew how it came about. We had to wait later to get the story. Father survived. And we had to uh, uh, wait later what had happened that day. Now, what happened that particular day is the following story. Father worked as an artist in that place. The Gestapo went in the factory in front of all the workers, called him up and said, are you one of the Bibel Forscher Jehovah Witness? My father said, yes. He said, come along. That's it. He was arrested in front of everybody. He had to take his bicycle. The Gestapo car was driving next to it for three miles behind him. Exactly at the moment, my mother was shopping. She had a shopping hour every day she was out. So we didn't know. I was in school. Mother was shopping. During that time, they came home. They searched in the apartment, not everywhere, because they didn't find the Elberfeld Bible. But they found other things. But we didn't see that somebody had been in the house. They did that very discreetly. When father came to the Gestapo, they asked him the same question, the names of other witnesses. He didn't answer. Then the reaction of my father, my father was soft, an artist, you know. But when he had to talk, he was very cutting when something went wrong, you know. So he had that cutting tone, you know. The SS said, I put you on the oath. Yes or no? Do you know them? Because they gave them the names, you know. And Father said, for you, it's always going to be no. And of course, the SS jumped over the desk, beat him in the face, unconscious, and he came into prison. Now while he was alone in a prison cell, he heard somebody crying on the other side. And he realized it was his friend's voice, Köl Adolf, which I mentioned before. And that man was sickly. I mean, he had a lot of difficulties. And that was crushed down when he heard him, you know, sighing and crying on the other cell. He thought, well, that other Adolf, because both had the same name, the other Adolf 
wouldn't be able to overcome everything. Dad was in that prison from 4th September until December. And when he came out to go to Shirmek, the first camp I mentioned speci specifically made for the Alsatian, he got his first letter from my mother. And he heard that Adolf was never arrested. They used another man who had similar voice to weaken my father down. See? To put mental pressure on him. And that Adolf was never arrested. They knew he was one of Jehovah's Witnesses, but he was a barber. And apparently, according to what we could find out later, the Gestapo said, you let him with his barbershop work because a Jehovah Witness won't cut us the throat. They had no confidence in the Alsatians. They were afraid to go to Alsatian barber and get killed. So they said, we leave that witness out there. And he had all the SS coming by to get shaved. But he did not, not know anything about that program, you know. Um, neither did my father during that time. This came out after the war, of course. Anyhow, going back to the situation, we expected to be arrested because the Gestapo said they would come and get us. And as time went by, the winter came, that closed down the bank account. My mother had no, no money, no right to work. They took away her working card. She was on personal welfare. Some uh, Jehovah Witnesses took care of her, and she would do mending and knitting and sewing, you know, uh, just to get the necessary food for us, for us too. We had no coal. We couldn't heat in the winter, you know, sparely heating. We had a very hard time, and I got sick, uh, most probably also from emotion, because, you know, when my father was gone, Everything was gone in that house because he did the reading, he did the talking. As a matter of fact, his place was so big in that house that our dog, which I mentioned before, who he had the habit to lie down on his feet, every night that dog went in front of that, uh, uh, of that uh, wheelchair and started off crying. Whoa, whoa. We had to change the whole furniture. The dog wouldn't give up, you know. He was searching after his master. So mother had the whole thing moved around, you know, and changed uh, the colors of the place and everything. Bought herself a new table, made underneath a hiding place for the Bible literature, you know. And we were waiting for the Gestapo. We had constantly our luggage ready. Was, you, were you, was your mother con still witnessing to oh, other people? Oh, yes. How yes. about yourself? Yes, I was talking in school too. When did you start witnessing? Uh, 1938, 37, 38. You would witness to your students in school? And from house to house, uh, visiting people in a country, you know, uh, uh, distributing Bible literature, encouraging them to read the Bible. What, what kind of reactions would you get right away back uh, when you first? Very bad, very hard. The Alsatian were strong Catholics, you know, and most of the time uh, we had a very hard time. Uh, you know, people would spit on us and uh, throw stones and uh, all sorts of mean things. But uh, uh, somehow it didn't affect me because I thought, uh, well, uh, when you go through the gospel, you see that Jesus and the apostle have been threatened many times, and this is a part of our life. I mean, we expect that. We are not looking forward to it, no. But we know if it comes, it's something which, well, you can understand that people react uh, you know, against our message this way because their teachers have misled them. The teachers have been telling them that we were apostates, that we were cast off, that we were uh, coming out of, hev of the hell. We were devils, even in my family. All my family turned the back on us, you know, my grandmother, everybody. When did that happen? Uh, right away, as soon as we became witness, you know because of the Catholic Church's teaching in those days. It was, it, it was uh, I would say, almost like Middle Age. You know, when, when you were pitch-pointed, you know, uh, being not like the others. They, they, 
there was no possibility of them to understand why you changed. They, they just thought that changing would, is being a uh, creator. So they, they acted like that, you know. You were cast off by your family before ever the Germans came on you. So we, we had already that feeling of being like soldiers, you know, fighting for what we believed was the truth. Do you remember the last conversation you had with your grandmother before he cast you off? Uh, well, the last thing I remembered is that uh, she told me that I came back uh, right away uh, out of hell, that uh, the devil has taken possession of me, you know. And I was only about eight or nine years old in those days. She came back on this. I mean, uh, as time went back, she realized that it was a mistake on her part. She just was under influence, like many people are. I mean, there's nothing to it. Uh, people get the wrong ideas, and that's not the main thing. But coming back on our situation. What, well, talking about school and your witnessing, though, yes. up until 1941, Yes. you continued to witness at school? I continued to talk at school, but uh, uh, I know we had a different kind of schooling in those days. You had the state school where you had to go. When you were a good student, you could go to uh, what they called a lyceum, but parents had to pay for that. Then they had another one which was called college, in between. If you were good at college, you could switch over at the lyceum when you were 14, 15. But the college was free, you didn't have to pay, you see. So when I was nine years old, my parents had decided I should go to college. So I made the entry in college well, in, during the French time. But college, uh, in college I had less contact with other children because we, uh, the, the time, uh, the playtime in between school was gone. It was handled that way, you know, you came to school, you, you listened to your uh, schooling and you left home. And since it, uh, the children came from all parts of the city, I had no one traveling with me in the same direction. So my witnessing in school dampened, got smaller, of course, because I had no contact due to uh, the circumstances. When the German came, they instituted that famous Hail Hitler. Now, Hail Hitler was the greeting of all the children when they came into school. When the teacher came in, they had to go up and stretch their arm and say, Heil Hitler. When he got out of the class, they got on the feet, Heil Hitler. Now, a, something I would like to stress is that that Heil Hitler is a physical greeting. The hands up in class outside in the street like that. You will see Hitler once in a while like that, and then you see him again like that, you see? There were the two, but it was always physical. So it was hard to hide. It was not only the lips, it was also the hands. So even in street, when we met a teacher, we would have to hail, you see? He wouldn't look on our mouth, he would look on our hands. So I learned to be very careful and have my eyes everywhere, you know, not to get caught, because, as I believe, you could not hail a human man. Hail means salvation. And in my understanding of the Bible, only the Messiah, only a God-given Messiah could be hailed. Not the person could give hail to any man on earth, and of course not to a monster like Hitler was. By that time I had read what was going on with Jehovah's Witnesses in camp. I have seen people being arrested. I knew what kind of system that was to the teaching of evolution. How could I hail such a man and such an ideology? So I took my stand. Well, when they 
well, I should say in those days, the Catholic priest used to come to school to teach Catholic religion in school, during school hours. This is still going on in my home country. Oh, yes. And so when that man came in, in school, before the war, there was a cross in the classroom. Not a Catholic school, plain state school had a cross. When Hitler came, they took the cross down and put Hitler on the place and the cross underneath. Well, when the priest came before Hitler, his greeting would be, blessed is the one that cometh in the name of uh, the Lord. As soon as Hitler came along, the priest went like this, Heil Hitler, blessed is the one that cometh in the name of the Lord. And the whole class would say, Hartley, Heil Hitler, Amen. So this I have seen over and over and over again. Now when he came, I went out of class because I didn't want to take up that course and I had to stand outside and wait the whole hour. How were you able to conceal the, your feeling at that moment when the whole class... I was disgust. Disgust. And my feeling was hatred toward uh, this way of, uh, uh, of uh, what shall I say, uh, um, get a religious symbol down, crushed down under the, the feet of Hitler, you know? Because we don't use the cross as Jehovah Witness. This is just the information for you. Jesus died on a, s a stake, not on a cross. The cross business is completely... Well, anyhow, but it still stands there for a religious symbol. And for them to have Hitler in f top of the greeting, in top of the image, in top of everything, and the Catholic Church did go with it. In the church you had the the the, the um, uh, what shall I say the uh, the flag inside the church. Well, they claim they had to do that. Well, it's a matter of conscience. Huh? You cannot force anybody who doesn't want to. That doesn't exist. Anyhow, I was standing outside, and another German girl who was atheist was also out of that, you know, of that uh, teaching of that priest, and two other girls. And we did not see a teacher coming by. We four girls were uh, laughing, you know, in a corner and playing. And uh, she came by, and suddenly she turned around, put us on the wall, said Heil Hitler. And three of them said Heil Hitler, and I didn't. So she took me in front of the three other ones and greeted once more Heil Hitler. And all three said Heil Hitler, and I didn't. So she said, what's the matter? I said, I'm a, a Christian. And in the Bible it is said, Heil belongs only to Christ. Nobody can be hailed on earth. Oh, she said, Bibelforschung, I see. And she ran away. And she did not go to the school director, you know, the one who was responsible. She went across to the one who was responsible for the whole country denouncing me. So this was on a Saturday. Monday when I came to school, my teacher called me up and he said, here is a paper. You have to go from class to class with this paper and have it read by the teacher and signed by the teacher. The classes were very large. In those days, there were 45 children, double classes, because the uh, people were uh, in war, you know, teachers were in war. And it was a big place, because there were boys and girls, not mixed. There were all together 38 classrooms I had to go through. So this took me the whole week. And you know what was written on that paper? It has been known that one of the children in school is 
rebellious against German peace, against German behavior. We give the following warning. By the end of this week, this person has to make a decision, submitting or leaving school, because we cannot allow a rebellious child to be in school. Underneath has to be brought from class to class by the child Simon Arnold. So I heard this 36 times a whole week. In the middle of the week, my teacher said, you come home with your mother. We went to his place. The name of the teacher was Zipf. He was a Baptist. He talked with mother a long time, and he said to me, look, I fully agree with you. I don't hail Hitler either. You look at me. You know, I do it with the left hand not with the right. I don't give my support with the right hand. I do it with the left hand, and I pray to God and said, you know, my heart belongs to you. This is just to keep my freedom. Do it like I do. I said, I can't. For me, it's a lie. I cannot lie. The Bible says you shouldn't lie. I, I cannot agree with it. Left or right hand, I do not want to hail. So Saturday, when I came to class, I knew all about the children of the class didn't, because it, this had happened outside, you know. So when I came to class, on the board was written that we should take our uh, papers and copy this page. There was no teacher there, no one, you know. And after a while, came my school teacher and director of the school, the principal. They came up, so all the class already, you know, got a heavy load. They realized that something was going on there. So the principal went on with a wonderful, typical German talk. Germany is a country of freedom. Germany gives the choice to anyone for the future. Now, the future is you go along with the state and you have all education you need. You come up, you know, as an Aryan and so on and so forth. If you don't want that, there is no room for a person who doesn't try to kept, keep the race up. So it's your own choice. You have a choice. Either you submit or you leave. Now, this is freedom. And when he went through his speech, he said, the child who recognized himself, herself, may get up. So I stood up. And the whole class made, oh, because they didn't believe it would be me. I was known as very quiet. So he had me called in front of all the children. He said, you see here, are your papers? Here is Hitler. The class stand up. In five minutes' time, we are going to salute. It's your last chen change. chance. We give you five more minutes. Here is your paper to go out of school, or here you say, Heil Hitler. He went up. He took his watch. Five minutes over. Heil Hitler. Sieg Heil. Sieg Heil. Sieg Heil. Heil, the whole class, was standing there, you know, my fingers were like that. And I was determined, I said, I want those papers, those papers. During the five minutes, they sounded like hours. My head got like this, my feet got small, I got cold and shivering. But the only thing I had in my mind, I want those papers because I want to hail my Lord and not Jesus. So I took the papers and ran out. 
all right. I was old. My teacher came back and said, no, you stay with us until uh, the end of the school day. We are going to, you know, to have a, a, re a class reading together and, uh, because he loved me, he liked me, you know. And by Monday, I had to go back to that communal school, the one, you know, the lower class. All right, my mother came with me. And they, there the principal said, Oh, I cannot take her. A girl who doesn't say hi little? Impossible. Well, my mother said, you sign a paper that you cannot take her, and I to do the teaching. I'm able to do the teaching for her. I don't have to, uh, anybody, you know. Well, that he couldn't do, because he was under obligation to take the children. So he got a, an idea which sounded easy, but turned up to be hard. <coughs> he said, anybody, nobody has the right to know why you had to leave college and come back to communal school. You do not speak to anyone about the reason why you are here. Now children are curious, aren't they? Some of those children I had left two years before. And there I was in that class. The teacher got a note from the director say, uh, saying to her, you sit that lady in the back of the class, the girl, and don't care after her. No teaching, no reading, no question, nothing. She stays there and you forget about her. So here I was in that school all by myself and didn't get any uh, help anymore from the teacher. But just before my father had been arrested, uh, he had gotten in contact with a young lad who was 22 years old and started off studying the Bible and became one of Jehovah's Witness just before my father was arrested. And he would come home be, uh, just to get talks about the Bible with my mother. And when he heard that, that nobody would take care with my schoolwork, he came home to help me getting on with my schoolwork. Also with my piano lesson, because we had no money, as I told you before. And uh, he paid for my piano lesson. He wanted that my father was missing that I wouldn't miss out on education. Marcel Sutter was his name. And he became a very close friend, helped me along with my school schoolwork. But in that class, I didn't talk to anyone because of what the principal had said. I was very quiet. I went my way, came just in the last minute to school, wouldn't talk in playtime, wouldn't go out with other children, because I thought it's better not to talk. Maybe uh, hatred from someone could turn my words around in my own mouth, you see. So I stepped a little bit away, but the girl who was sitting next to me one day said, oh, I know why you have been sent off. Most of the children said I had stolen or I had said some lies or do something wrong, you know. And she said, that's not true. You are just here because you are French resistant. And I said, oh no, nothing to do with politics. I'm just plain a Christian. Oh, she said, me too. Oh, I said, well, if you would be a Christian, you would understand what I'm standing for. She said, well, you are resistant because you don't sing any German songs, you don't greet, never say Heil Hitler, you never do anything like the others. I said, you know, this is based on Bible principles because the Bible says that you have to keep away from bloodshed, from war, from killing, from any political 
uh, uh, actions, and that's why I'm here. So, the following day or two days after that conversation, when I came to school and wanted to put something under the table, I found a package there. It was some flour, butter, things you couldn't buy anymore. She said, my mother had given that to you for your father. Maybe you can send something to the camp. No. When I came home with it, my mother said, girl, never accept anything from anyone. This is dangerous. You get the address of those people, I bring the package back, you know? That's what happened. And through that, Bible questions were discussed. And this family became Jehovah Witness. And that girl who was very tall, Jeanette Schmerber is her name, stopped saluting, stopped saying Hail Hitler. And of course, being a tall lady already, this had been seen by the school director. So he mentioned it in the reports he had to give over to the most, the principal of the whole school, you see. Now, just to let you know how I felt during that time, I had one fear, a very big fear who was upon me. I was that scared they would take my mothers away and I would stand alone in the street. I always had that word, the Gestapo will get you. And just an experience among others. I told you a while ago I got sick in the winter 1941-42, just after the rest of my father. And one day my mother didn't come home in time. She had been going out uh, giving Bible lessons to someone. And she missed out on the streetcar, which should have brought her back home. And I had fever. And the night came. And I said, that's it. I went out of bed, put my shoes on with no socks, in the night gone, put my coat on, and went straight to the police office. There, at the police place, I went from door to door, putting my ears on the doors, wondering if I could get the cross-examination I have he had heard before, you know. I went all over the place. Happily for me, no one came out of the doors asking me what I was doing there, you know. And by the time I came out of the police station, the other streetcar came up, and my mother was in there, you see. But that's the way I was. I. The only thing I was afraid of is not my own situation. It was my mother should be protected. I wanted to protect my mother. And uh, my mother was uh, not too well on health, you know. So I had that feeling that uh, uh, it would be terrible if I would stay alone. I could handle myself, I thought, but I, I couldn't have the, stand the idea that she had to go the same way as dead. Well, I went back to that school, and the police had come home. They had checked to find out if we had any publications from the watchtower. They never found anything. They left without arresting mother. They came and left and came and left, you know. Each time I would hear some man, heavy boots in the staircase, a wooden staircase, you know, the second floor, we were living in second. I jumped at mother and grasped on her, you know. I said, that's it. So, and I went up, I relaxed again, you know. This was that period of time, which was very hard. Then we got a letter that dad had been sent to Dachau. And after a while, we had learned that we could send packages to Dachau. So mother made copies of some of the Watchtower publications. She read it very fine, and rolled it together, large like this, and put it between cakes. But a very cheap kind of cake, 
in order that it couldn't be stolen, you know, not something the SS would steal away. See, she made packages, in that package used to be those cookies and uh, uh, some, uh, what you call, uh, argile in, is the French word, that's uh, um, uh, clay, you know, clay you take for your health, you swallow it, yes, they do that in Europe. And mother thought maybe he has trouble with his health, he could have this, you know. And fish oil, she said fish oil nobody's going to steal and he will have vitamins. And so she was sure those packages would go through, and they did get through, you see. Father did get them. And happily so, he got this clay just after he had typhus. He was two weeks unconscious with typhus, and he survived. And then he could get a little bit more strength with those packages coming in. Now I'll come back later on on father's side, you know. What year was that when the uh, when the, uh, the when packages? Forty-two, mm -hmm. nineteen forty-two, forty-three uh, was the time uh, they had the uh, things going on. So during the time my father was gone, Marcel Sutter would come home for my schooling, and Curl, which I mentioned before, uh, the close friend, we would go to his garden and do Bible studying and uh, secret work, I mean underground work in his garden. And they were very close to us, you know, had been mother who continued to knit and sew and everything, you see. But in school, things got worse because of the fact that that girl refused to salute. That didn't go on her, but they got on at me. So one day, I got a call by the Gestapo. I had to go to the Gestapo. Well, it didn't say it was the Gestapo. It says there were psychiatrists, too. But one of them was the man who had been home with mother. The 4th of September, you see, so we knew who they were. They put me in a room, whitewashed, the corner desk. One was sitting here, the other one sitting there. I was put in a s chair. My mother was behind me. She couldn't touch me nor see me. They had s very strong white lights in my face, you know. And they went on with cross-questioning. Now I give you an example. They would say, for instance, give us the five continents by starting by the smallest one. Well, then you go Australia, it's very easy, but which one is then smaller? Africa or, uh, or Asia or South Af uh, America, you know? You, you go on thinking. During that time, the other one would say, where did you get the watchtower from? The other one would say, the continent, the watchtower, the continent, you know? Then went on like that for an hour. Well, every time they would see in my mother's face any kind of reaction, you know, they would get back on the question from another side. Well, happily so, I did not give in any names and no place. They couldn't get anything out. But I certainly was exhausted. I was to the point of fainting. When the bell rang, and they had to leave for another business, leaving me alone. So this report came into the Gestapo's file. No, in class, suddenly, it was said that our class was selected to go to a youth camp for two weeks. And every child had to bring a 50 pfennig, this is uh, some money, every week to pay the stay. I never borrowed any money, and I never talked to my mother over the matter. Because I said to myself, if I talk to mother, she will know 
And if she gets under interrogation, they might feel that she knows. And she will be made responsible for me. Things I didn't want to. I had decided not to go because I said if I go there, they will salute the flag every morning, salute the flag every evening. They will have lots of military uh, exercises. I will refuse everything. I will be under beating the whole day, so I may as well refuse the whole thing in the beginning. It's easier than to go through the ordeal of being constantly under that pressure. Now, my teacher, it was a lady. She didn't mention anything that I didn't bring any money. Though the time came, that lined up all the, uh, the money of the class. Well, Arnold is in the beginning. But she didn't, she didn't ask me a word, nothing. The director came, and he was happy. And he saw the conclusion, the money, he, he left, you know. And two minutes afterwards, he came back, white, red in the neck. Arnold, where is your money? He said, I have none. I have no father. He said, you get the money by tomorrow. I didn't answer. The following morning, the money was not there. And I still hadn't talked to my mother. So he called me up and said, where is the money? I said, I will not go. I refuse to go. Is that your mother's order? I said, my mother doesn't know anything about that. So he took me in front of the class and he said to the children, now look how Jehovah's Witnesses are raising their children. Now she's 12 years old and she takes her own decision, doesn't even talk to her mother anymore. So he said to me, you come either to the camp or to my office Monday morning. If not, you have the police at home. Well, just a few days before that, the judge had called me in. And the judge went on talking about the famous German freedom, the kind of speech, you choose what you want to do, you are free, you are the master of your own life, you know. And when he saw that I wouldn't give in, he had given the order to put me in a Nazi home, in a re-educational home. So I was already under the sentence of being arrested when this happened for refusing to go to that camp. Monday morning, I went to his place. Truly so, I wasn't there at eight o'clock. I was afraid, very much so. I came there, it was a quarter past eight, shivering all over the place. He didn't expect me anymore. When he saw me, he turned again white on his red neck, you know, took me by the shoulder, put me in his class in the first row. He had all his class going up during two hours, up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down, and constantly saying, she is responsible, she is responsible. You know? After that, he distributed the homework of the children. Each one had to go up to him. He would take, he would take the, the homework slap it in the face of each child and just throw it in the class. She is responsible. That went on for all 45 children. And what he had in mind is that those children, when they come out, they would get after me. And the opposite happened. They were much younger than I was. I was 12, they were 9. They came up and they said, you keep strong against him, that dirty man. It's a pig that's not a man. You stand strong, you know. It did not happen what he wanted. Didn't know why. I took that stand. 
but they felt that I was resisting and I appreciated my resistance. Even so, they had no the strength to do so. I lately got a letter from one, one of those ladies uh, who wrote me on saying, I still remember that specific day. And I said, if one day I have a child, it's going to be called Simone. So she has a child who's called her Simone because of that particular day, you see. Because she was only nine, but she re just remembers all what was going on. Well, the week I passed with him was ordinary. He, the person would shout constantly and, and, you know, be at the children. But somehow he was quiet with me until the end of the week. The end of the week, he had sent me off to a certain work. Now, this work was connected with gathering material from house to house every week each child had to bring two pounds of material bones papers uh, material or uh, boxes cans for recuperation and everything was thrown in a corner and there he went on me and he said now you go and sort put the bones in one corner, the cans in another, and so on. And I looked at that and I said, man, this is war job. I, I'm not going to, to work for war. So I didn't do anything. And he came. He said, where's your work? I said, I haven't done any. Why? I said, I don't wor uh, work for war. He said, what's the matter with you? Does a bone or, or material kill? I said, no, but if I... I take the bone in one corner and material in the other corner, what's left is the can, and the can is going to be used to make bombs. I don't want that. So I said, you are going to do it? I said, no. So he took his hand, he was hitting me in the neck, unconscious, and threw me in all that stuff. There were worms in there, you know, filthy uh, bones, I mean bones in the sun. Uh, you just can see what that is, looks like, you know. He was putting me there. And the girls, after they came out of their class, took me home. I could hardly walk. So my mother brought me to the doctor. And the emotion and everything made me uh, to become uh, uh, my first menstruation very strong. So mother brought me over to the doctor. And the doctor said, well, it's all that emotion going on, you know just the flooding, it just needs rest. So on Monday, mother had a letter from the doctor. On Tuesday morning, the police got me to bring me back to school. And the doctor had the Gestapo home and said, the next time you give a kind of a document like this to any of Jehovah's Witness, you go in concentration camp. So that was it no doctor help. I went back to school. Well, I was under condemnation. Still was afraid mother would be taken away, you know. And then I was surprised. The girls had come back from camp and they all had turned against me. It just looked like I would have had the worst sickness in the world, you know, lepers. They just not even would touch me. I said, what's going on? Well, I knew two weeks of Nazi education, you know, with the songs and everything would make them come up for Germany, but not to that extent. But it just was such an atmosphere, you know. I said, yeah, well, what's going on? Well. By uh, Wednesday, all the classes had to go, go to the schoolyard in square. In the middle was a pool with a flag. Well, the flag was not on it. The flag was folded on a cushion on the floor. 
I was hiding behind the tall girls, the, the director of the school was there, the principal, you say, was there. He said, where is Arnold? Get the Arnold child in front. So they took me, put me in the front, and I sneaked again a little bit back. I thought, everybody is like that, and I'm like that. Everybody's going to see it. Better be, uh, you know, got behind. He got up to the pool, and he said again to my teacher, where is Arnold? You put, put her ahead of everybody, alone. It's OK. They put me uh, about this distance. And I said, that's it. This is going to be the thing, you know, the heavy. So the boy came in, uh, you know, in the Hitler Youth with a flag. I put the flag up, you know, and a threefold Heil Hitler and Heil, 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 and then the national song and the, uh, the Horst Wessel song, you know, they had two songs. And all stretched out during the whole song, you know. I was standing like that. I got, you know, I almost felt like going into the earth, so heavy, so loaded, you know. And he went on with a big, big, big talk, saying that Germany is a country of freedom and a country where each one can choose his uh, future. And uh, the education was the best one in the world. And uh, some might not appreciate that, but there's their own choice. And you soon will have an example what happens to someone who does not submit to German rule. So in myself, I said, I'm going to be beaten to pieces, you know. Well, the flag came down, three times seek higher, all the thing over again, you know. And everybody departed, and I stood there all alone. And no man spoke to me, not the teacher, not the principal, no one. Just the same feeling of being like, you know, well, lepers. And I remember I went home with a funny feeling, uh, a feeling I didn't understand what had happened, you know. It had been very heavy on me. I had been trembling. And a certain moment, I remember I had been shaking there like a leaf, and suddenly I said, oh, God, please give me the strength. I do not want to tremble in front of all those people. And right away I kept quiet. But in spite of that, I had the feeling something goes wrong. So when I came home, we had a long hall, a little table there, and there was a letter. As I came up, I saw Simon Arnold. I opened the letter. It was my arrest for the following morning. My mother was not there. She was out on the balcony. She let me alone with a letter. I read that, that I had to be on the station the following morning. The room was open, and on my bed were lying all my dresses, you know, and the luggage. And mother came. She took me in her arms, and she said, you know, Simon, you are now over 12 years old. This is the time when in the higher society, children go away from home to go in boarding schools to be taught higher education. Now you are going to have higher education. What you will learn is going to help you your whole life. So take it as an occasion to grow up. And in the afternoon, she said, let's go to the city and buy some things you might need. And she bought me a little box with uh, thread and things, you know, to mend and hiding a Bible, a little Bible in there underneath. And she said, most probably you would be able to keep that, you know. All right. The following morning, we went to the station at 8 o'clock. Two ladies were there. And I sent my mother away. My mother said, how are you going to Konstanz? Well, by train. 
special train? No, normal train. She said, right, I have a right to go on a, spe on a normal train. So she bought the ticket and she came along. So these were old train cars where you go all on the side, you know, platform on the side. And uh, once we were over the Rhine River, uh, mother said, could I have a talk with my child on the platform outside? And I said, all right, as long as you come in before we go into a station. She said, I want, we won't escape. You are not the type of escaping. You know, my, my father was a, in concentration camp. He would have been hanged if we would have disappeared. So here we were on the train, and she would go over again Bible lessons like the three Hebrews and the fire, you know, the story of Daniels with the lions and the first Christians in the uh, arena of the Romans, you know. And we were uh, on, it passed the Schwarzwald, the mountains, the Black Forest. Uh, the atmosphere was horrible. It was gray, it was rainy, it was uh, really, uh, according to circumstance, you know, uh, mother had me in her arms and she talked to me and said, you are well prepared little girl. As a matter of fact, she did a lot between the time father had left until the moment I was arrested. That is between the 4th September 41 and the 9th of June 43. Mother had taught me how to wash, how to sew, how to knit, how to cook or to garden, because she said we might go into hardship and if by any chance you will have to work, it's better if you know how to work than to learn it by people who don't love you. Because if you are going to be taught by anyone that hates you, you will suffer. So when she said on that train that I was a little girl uh, ready to face life, it was true. She had gotten me ready in many ways, not only mentally, morally, but also physically, also in work. Anyhow, when we arrived in Konstanz, it still was raining. How long was the trip from, uh, from your Well, home? we left at 8 o'clock in the morning, and it was uh, toward 2 o'clock in the afternoon we had arrived. Those trains those days were very... Uh, well and fast, you know. The two ladies grasped me and we walked over to the place which was a house located between two border roads going over to Switzerland. And the property was alongside the border. It was a beautiful property. The history about the property is interesting. It is called the Wissenbergische Erziehungsanstalt. Wissenberg being the name of a man who lived in the same time as Pezzalozzi, who is the, fun, uh, the one who had the foundation for orphan homes in Switzerland, still going on up till this day. And he was a priest, as well as Pezzalozzi was a bishop. And it was his private house, a uh, house who was about 250 years old, with a beautiful flower garden in the entrance, roses, and beautifully well done. And when time came for him to die, he said that his property would not be turned into the Catholic Church, but to the city of Konstanz to make an orphan home. So this was, in the beginning, an orphan home. And an orphan home, which was built about 150 years ago, the setting inside, you know, the tables in wood and, and the bed were on a, a black uh, material, uh, what shall I say, uh, metal, metal beds, black metal beds, you know. And uh, inside a straw mattress, covered up, of course. It was like middle age. The whole setting was like middle age. Well, we arrived in this place, and in the entrance, the two ladies stopped and said to my mother, you cannot come in here. 
So she said, where is that written? There is no sign here saying that a mother cannot go into that place. So they took me in. We walked to that rose garden, you know, to that house. And my mother was walking behind. They rang the door, big stair going up. They rang the door, big bell. The director came out, white hair, long dressed, very stiff, very German-like, blue eyes, uh, cold. And she said, who is that lady down there? Well, the two ones said, oh, we could not get rid of her. You know, it's the mother of the child. So she put the ladies aside. She said, I always have respect for a mother who comes along with the children, with the child. You come up here. So we entered the place, special place, of course, a room. And she listened to mother for what was going on with Jehovah Witnesses in Germany. And she said, you know, I haven't gotten the paper from the court yet. You have it, but I don't have it. And as long as I don't have the court paper, I cannot take the child. So by tomorrow, I will have the papers. I will go to the court myself and get it this afternoon for tomorrow. So my mother jumped up and said, do you mean that we are free until tomorrow? She said, yes, you are. So the two ladies said, no, no, you cannot leave her go. The director said, I have confidence in this lady. This lady is going to bring the child back. I know that. So you are off this afternoon. Well, mother said, where are we going to sleep tonight? She said, you take the boat, cross the uh, Bodensee. This is the, a lake which is as big as the one of Geneva, you know. You go on the other side, it's cheaper. You go to Meersburg. All right, we went to Meersburg in a hotel. And of course, mother wouldn't talk to me. Not a word, because we were afraid some years would be around, you know, denunciation, things like that. So we had supper in that hotel, and we went up to the vineyard, which is just on the bottom of the castle. We stepped into that vineyard place, and there we had our last prayer and song together. Their mother was praying, O oh Jehovah, help my little girl to stay faithful. And then we had a resurrection song because we were almost sure we would die. We had no prospect of surviving in this ordeal of the Germans, you know. And so we sang that song together. And then she took me back to the hotel. Do you remember the song? Yes. It's a, a, a song who said the Will we see each other again, certainly in the resurrection? Do you remember the tune? Yes. Ganz gewiss. Na 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 so that was it. We came back to the hotel. She was boarding me once more, kissing me once more, and I slept very, very quietly. The following morning, things went very fast. We had to take the boat at 8 o'clock in the morning. We jumped down to that boat. We didn't speak because people were around, you know, just, just squeezed in, uh, toward her body, you know. And we came back to the Wesenbergische Erziehungsanstalt. Now the door got open, and that lady who had told us that we were free was as harsh and hard as possible. As soon as she saw me, she called a girl, girl again. She said, take her away, show her everything. She crossed me, I 
couldn't say goodbye to my mother. That was it. So she brought me to a bedroom with about um, 12 beds who were the place where the girls who were young ladies stayed to separate them from the other ones, younger ones. Wait, more people there. 37 children between 5 and 14. At age 14, uh, all Germans, at age 14, they had to become mates at, for doctors or for higher people, you know. They were trained to become mates. So they took my shoes off. We had to go barefoot from 1st of April until 1st of, uh, well, I say from Easter until Halloween. We had to go barefoot. I got a special dress on, of course, an overdress, some, some kind of a apron, but looked more like a dress, you know. And they showed me my bed. They brought me down. I got six pairs of socks to mend. And when they gave me the socks, they said nothing to eat until they are done. And if they are not well done, nothing to eat at all. And when they meant when done, uh, well done, it was really well done, like broderie, you know, taking one, going nice up and down and up and down, uh, perfect work, you know. So how happy I was that my mother had taught me. Because I didn't get punished, but I started off mending, you know, and it went <laughs> and started off crying and cried and cried and cried. Those socks got wet. I had a hard time to mend them, you know. It went very bad, and I went to bed and was still crying. So we had to go to bed. Now, this was a whole ceremony. You had not the right to undress in front of anybody, you know. Middle age, like middle age. So you had to take the nightgown over and hold the nightgown like this and then underneath take everything off. And the same thing in the morning. You had to take the nightgown up and put the things underneath on, you know, when you were dressed underneath, you took the wet. This was a ceremony, you know. All right, I went to bed and continued crying until I was exhausted and I said, I don't know, three o'clock in the morning, something like that, when I finally could sleep. And we had to get up at six o'clock in the morning. And when I got up, I had blood stained my bed. So I said, that's it, my problem, me and I. So the first teacher who came across, I ran to the person and I said, I had an accident last night blood stain my, my bed. She called a girl, show her how to wash her sheet. So they had me outside, it was cold, the, the, the floor was cold, I, much paints, uh, you know, uh, the problem was there. Cold water and to wash that sheet. So I was washing and scrubbing the sheet. I didn't hold my sheet correctly, so I got a completely wound here, you know. Uh, uh, my, my skin was gone because the, the, the thing didn't want to, to go away, you see. And I started off crying again. So the teacher came, she was young, she was 32 years old, or 33. She stood under the door and she said, Ah, you're crying? Ask your Jehovah to wash your, uh, your uh, um, bed sheet. I looked at her, you know, I said, girl, that's not the way to get about it. You stop crying and you don't cry anymore here because if this goes on God's plane, you don't want that. So I dried my eyes and she never was able to make me cry anymore. She tried several other ways to get me down, you know. But I got my lesson that day. That straightened me right away out. Do okay. you remember her name, that teacher? Messinger, Frida Messinger. And what about the director of, of the... The director, uh, Lederle, was cold, but she was more uh, honest. 
Do you remember her name? Lederly. Lederly was her name. Lederly was her, her family name? Uh, yes, her family. I don't know her first name. Were these teachers Catholic? Yes, all of them. All of them. So, all right, it was said to me, school from, well, getting up, I should say, in the morning. We had to do our beds by open window, even in winter time. Go up and wash only the back and the face, nothing else. Everything else was forbidden, except on evenings the feet. But everything else, nothing, absolutely nothing. We got the panties changed once a week, and if they were soiled, the child didn't get anything to eat for a day or two. We had uh, the bed changed three times a year, the sheets. We had caps on on the head because of the greasy hair, because they get washed twice a year, one for Easter, one for, uh, for Christmas. It was like middle age. Everything was like middle age. But the worst of this all is that we had no right to talk to each other. I stayed two years without talking to anyone, except once. Now this was a girl who was next to me. This girl, one evening, I was in a corner, uh, my bed was in a corner. The other bed would go the opposite, you see. But she was next to me. She said, I have the feeling you are here in this house for another reason than the other children. You have different behavior. So I started off talking about the Bible, my Bible teaching. And suddenly, Sophie was her name, she said, oh, I saw Hilda going down Denunciation. Two minutes afterwards, Sophie, Maria, down. Okay, we went down. I never got punished for doing things wrong in Constance. My mother and uh, the friseur, the, the barber, Kurt Adolf, as well as Marcel Sutter, they always said, no, you be careful. Refusing to do something is not being stubborn. You make a difference between refusing something or getting stubborn. You are never stubborn. So I was very careful always to, to be as easygoing as possible. Well, that night I was in transgression because I talked. What did you talk about? Well, the Bible. The, the girl next to me was a Protestant. So she put a leather apron on. She took a rod. Uh, a soft, but I don't know what it was made, but it was soft. Girl had to bring the hand forth. She was beating on the fingers. So strong that it went down on her knees. That's why she had a letter apron on. And she did that seven times on each hand. You couldn't see the fingers anymore. And then Sophie had to leave. I handed my hand. She started off beating me and she looked in my face and she said, your religion is always responsible for your troubles. When it comes about religion, you don't, you, you, you don't know anything else anymore than talk. She said, all right, I won't punish you today but if it happens again, I catch up, it will twice as much. So I went up to bed crying as much as the other one, of course, emotion, you know. But that was not all. A child who had gotten beaten on the hands, so many strokes, so many evenings without eating. We all ate together in a big dining room and the child had to get up and say, Thank you, when the plate came into the soup, you know. Thank you, I have no right to eat because I'm punished. The child had to say that in order that everybody knew. And 
that meant seven evenings without food for Sophie. Now, when my plate, I was taller than Sophie, uh, elder, older, when my plate came up, I got on my feet and I said, thank you, I'm punished, I have no right to eat. And the teacher was so surprised, it was the director, she was so surprised, you know. She looked at me, she looked at Sophie and she said to Sophie, you come over here with your soup. I don't want to hear anything about that matter anymore. So she cancelled the punishment, you see, that's why I say she was, she had a sense of justice in there, in the director heart. She was hot harsh, you know, but there was still some justice in there. Well, at Sophie afterwards, once in the staircase, she said, I'm here already eight years, never saw that. I made like this, you see. I turned her down because we had no right to talk. After the war, I got in touch with her. And this is just a parenthesis, you know, I got a little bit out of the story. That uh, Sophie came in that house, she was five years old, as an orphan. And when she was 14, she was supposed to be a maid, and she was so afraid to live outside. She didn't know anything about life outside. There was an empty place in the kitchen. She asked if she could stay in the house, in the kitchen, work in the kitchen, and learn how to go out shopping and getting in contact with people. And they accepted her to go out. One week, she had to bring papers to the doctor who came in the house to check on the children. And that doctor closed the door and abused her. She was 14. And the same week, at the end, a man came and claimed her as being his child. Now she believed she was an orphan. And the true story is that German man was an officer at the German border, custom officer. His wife was Jewish. She gave birth to Sophie and died while giving birth. And that man took that child and went to the police and said, I don't want to raise her because she has Jewish blood. And they looked at her like an, an animal and they said, oh, well, let's give her a chance because she has blonde hair. Just dark eyes, but she has blonde hair. We may give her a chance and raise her. And there she got to get to know all this, the sexual abuse and her father coming back. And she got sick on diabetes and shortly thereafter died on it because of the emotional shock. Now coming back. What was Sophie's last name? I don't know. How did you find out that the final story about Sophie? Uh, because I had a friend who was working uh, on, the tra on the railroad train, you know, and could get a letter over, a contact letter to somebody who by chance knew her, she was married, and had discovered the connection through Jehovah Witnesses, you know. She had started off studying, but she did not survive. I saw her twice after the war. What did you talk about with her, uh, Sophie? Well, well she, she's the one that told me the whole story. Oh, you know. But Sophie, when did Sophie die? Uh, she must have died. I didn't get any answer anymore uh, around uh, 50... 152, something like that. But when I saw her last, she was already condemned, you know. She was, the doctor said she wouldn't live very long. They didn't have the medicine they had now, you know. They didn't know how to handle diabetes correctly. Huh? So, it, it was hard. You couldn't go into Germany in those days. It was because I had a secret a connection with, uh, with that uh, railroad man that I could get to it, you see. Anyhow, coming back on Constance, there's the only one to whom I talked in two years because we had no right to talk. 
Now the letters of my mother. But did you know any of the, any of the children before you went there? No, no. Re all didn't Germans, recognize all Germans. Most of them were children. Uh, according to what I could hear and see, who had been thieves or uh, uh, prost uh, children of prostitutes, you know, very... And then we get this uh, sort of talk in school. The school teacher would say, you do not deserve to be raised. It is just because the German government is so, uh, 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 you know, uh, open and so good to you that it gives you a chance to come back to a regular life. So at least I didn't have the Heil Hitler problem there because this was an honor which was taken away from us. So this was good for me, you see. But they get the whitewashed constantly, constantly. Those children were talked down, you know. You are, you are, you don't deserve all what the government is doing for you. You don't deserve the bread you eat. You don't deserve this. You don't deserve that, you know. It was constantly put on those children. Was there any mention of Hitler and, and the Third Reich? And uh, uh, yes, there was. There was. But in a sense, you don't deserve to come. You, you, you are not Aryans, you know. You, 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 you are dirty. We have to whitewash you first, you know. You don't have the honor to do anything for, you, for, uh, for Germany. And it was this kind of uh, talk going on, which did not bother me. But I guess for children who, who have been Germans, to hear that they are nothing worth, that they don't deserve the, the bed they are lying in or the, the soup they are eating all their lives is not the way to raise a child, is it? This was no uh, completely different surrounding, you see. Did th What did the children look like? Did they all look Aryan? Were they? Oh, yes. Oh yes, oh yes, most of them blonde, you know, with braids and, uh, oh yes, they were Germans, definitely blue eyes. I th think we had about three or four who had dark eyes, but all the other ones blue eyes. Yeah, they were true Germans. They were German children taken away, because I remember once we had to, uh, I was called to help with luggages. A child was going from the home to prison, because she could not get straightened out, I don't know, with stealing or whatsoever, I, I couldn't tell. But uh, when I came back with a teacher, after we had been on the railroad station, I got to talk and about how it goes with children who do not uh, uh, get corrected and so on, you see. Either they would get made or they would go to prison. Now after four months of being in that place, well, November it was, I was called back to the court once more, the second court case. In between this period of time, I had no connection with my parents. Letters came, but they had taken everything away from me. Even that little box, remember with the Bible? I could get the Bible out of the box before the box was taken away. Because in my bedroom, I had a little box to put my private, my privacy in there, you know, because I had menstruation already. So there were my private things. That was the only thing I had. Nothing private whatsoever. No cloth, nothing private. Not, absolutely nothing. No, not even a box. Not even a place where you could say this is mine. You had nothing. So when you say your private things, was well, this your uh, uh, things you need rags for yes, menstruation? Yes. That's all. So I had, ha had it there. And then my, when I came in the house, my first work was to clean the toilets. And after a while, I had to clean the room of one of the teachers. And I had to go under the bed every day. And so I said, let me put my Bible in the strings of her bed so I could read it. And that's what I did. That was uh, high, and I had to go under the bed every day to clean under, under there, lying on my belly. And I would have control, but the teacher who, who was in that room and would control me, she was a heavy type, and she had a hard time to go down her knees to see what I'm doing underneath. 
this gave me the chance to put my Bible just right back in the, in the, springs. In the springs again. Thank you. So there I could do my Bible reading. And then on Sunday, the first Sunday in that place, the three Catholic present went to church and the 33 Protestant went also to their church and I was all by myself. So I asked the director, that elderly person, Frau Lederle, to read my Bible in schoolroom because we had the schoolroom right in the house and the children didn't go out of the property. So okay, I could read the Bible there on the first Sunday, but when the teacher came along, Messinger, who was 32 years old uh, approximately, she said, what's that kid doing over here? And she said, we do not want that. She has not to read her Bible. She goes to the kitchen and cooks for the whole house. So every Sunday morning, you saw Maria, because Simone was French. They couldn't call me Simone. They called me Maria. Uh, they had Maria there. I was so small. They had to put me on a little bench, you know, because the soup pot was very high, and I had to turn that heavy soup for the 37 children because we had soup for them breakfast, we had soup on evening. And we had most of the time uh, some uh, potatoes at noon, uh, hardly any meat. The butter was used to make black market, you know. The teacher would sell it and tr turn it in for themselves, taking it away from the children. I had several times been called to take a big basket, there was butter in it, and then I sell it on top of it. I had to bring it to somebody in the town, so I know about what I'm speaking, you know, because I know where the butter went to. Uh, since they had confidence in me, being a witness, I could go out of the house in town to pay uh, uh, bills or to go to people and bring them something which came from the house, you see. So by the certain time, I could go out there in the city. And I had a set time. I had to be back in 20 minutes or half an hour according to the distance. And what I would do is run like mad in order to stay in line somewhere and listen what people were talking about the political situation of Germany. If they didn't talk about it, I ran to another place and tried to get the news to know where the uh, the Allies were, how it went on Russia, just to get to grasp some news, you know, to find out if there is any possibility of soon being liberated. So, after having been there for, uh, this was later, this was in 44 what I'm talking. When were you room. first allowed to go out of the Well, house? it must have been um, about five or six months after I had arrived to the place, you know. Was that your first thought to, to when you first went out of the house, to, to go in, in? No, not right away. What did no, what? it wasn't my need right away. This was a little bit later because uh, in 43 they still were strong and they would, wouldn't talk about you know, uh, the Germans were still sure to to win the war, so you didn't get anything in those days. It was a little bit later. But coming back to the house, which was well known, that house was an uh, orphan home in the beginning, and under the Nazi time it turned over to become a re-educational home but the way it was handled was the same. That is, that every week another bakery would bake the bread for the house or uh, the grocery. They had turns in the city. And that's why every week they had bills to pay in the different places. And we were well known because we were bar feeded with our special dress on and the braids. So we were very well known in the city whenever a child would go out to pay a bill, you see. In the time I was there, we only were two children to go out to buy, to pay bills because they didn't trust the other ones. That's how I could feel that the other ones had serious problem with honesty because they never could go out with bills. Who was the other? 
first? Well, no, the other children. We were seven children between seven and 14. From those seven, only three were between 12 and 14. And we did all the wash, the mending, the sewing, the cooking, the gardening for all 37 children. No men. And I had been in the place for two months when a girl of five years old came in, maybe an orphan, I don't know. I had to take care of her. I had to go up nights because that child was still uh, having her bed wet every day, so I had to wash her bed. So I had to go up at night to get that uh, girl to the toilet, you know. I was punished by it. I mean, I had to work when she did wrong. I had to raise her. So I had this responsibility on top of all the work. Now in the afternoon, Monday and Tuesday, would be with the wash and, uh, and the mending and then the gardening and so on. And in winter time, we went sawing wood trees, big trees. Oh, well, I was on trees were well, large like that uh, with another girl, you know, all day. But I loved to work. So it did not do me any harm because I had learned to work. I, I was happy to work. I mean, I didn't feel like being dishonored. It was rather a little bit the opposite way around. I was, a, uh, you know, uh, proud of my achievements. During those days, Mother had come home after she had left me in that place. And I was in peace with myself because I said, I am the one arrested, not my mother. But my mother, when she came home, she couldn't stand the apartment anymore. It was empty. No piano, the dolls were there, I wasn't there. She saw the painting of her husband, he was gone. So she left the place and she went to her mother's place up in the mountains and got arrested there. She got arrested because some people in the street said, what is she still doing in freedom? Why is she not arrested? So the police came up to my grandma. The dog was barking. Mother looked down the mountain, and when she saw who's coming up, she said, it's for me. She went toward the man he had arrested, and he said to her, which way do you want to go? The way I came from, out through the woods. The woods was shorter. She said, through the woods. So she went through the woods. She went down. The man took a longer time. It was an Alsatian. He was all surprised to find her at the police station. He had given her a chance to go over the border. The border was not far away. It was only three quarters of an hour climbing up the mountain. But my mother said, hi, my husband is in camp. My child is in a penitentiary home. They might kill both of them if I escape. So she went to the police. The police said, you have to go to the city again, to your own place where you live. So she went down to Mulhouse, to the police. It was a German man. He shook the hand of my mother and he said, Mrs. Arnold, I have to tell you something. And he looked out the window and on the other side of the road was a Catholic church with a house for the priest. He looked out and he said, do you know, when many dogs are hunting an animal in the forest, it doesn't have any chance to survive. He shook mother's hand and said, I feel sorry, but I have to hand you over to the Gestapo. I cannot do anything for you. So she was put 
to the Gestapo, which did not bother with her, didn't ask her a question, put her right away to Schirmeck in the concentration camp. So when I got the news uh, about her being in concentration camp, I realized that she would be strong enough to take it. How did you get the news? I got the news by the teacher themselves who told me that she was arrested, you know. They, they, had, they were happy to, especially that Messinger. She was always the one that wanted to crush me down, so she said, your mother has been arrested. But somehow I was in peace with myself because I had been arrested a few months before her, and I could feel that things went fairly well for me. So I said, it's going to be the same way. I had the feeling, you know, when I was praying, I had the feeling <coughs> I was just in my mother's arms. Just because my mother had the habit every evening to tell me a Bible story, uh, or, or the ones called the so-called Old Testament, which is not so old, it, it's just a testament, it's not an Old Testament. And she went over, you know, and Moses, and the Red Sea, and Daniel, and and uh, uh, you know all the prophets what they went through and uh, she knew how to tell the story you know I could, just could feel everything just like being there you know and this came back to my mind when I was praying I, I just had the feeling she was to just be right there and then sometimes when I look up in the heavens I said well if my parents look at the same moon at the same time uh, somewhere our eyes cross and come together. And that's the same feeling I had when I prayed. I say, my father is praying, my mother is praying, I'm praying here. And that comes together and makes only one prayer up there. So I was in peace with myself. And the arrest of my mother wasn't as bad as I had expected to be, you know, two years before. Well, one day my aunt came the sister of my mother and she managed to see me in the same place where we had been in the beginning with mother just an hour talk together and she somehow got the confidence of the teacher there of the director she said all right next time you come Maria can go out with you so she came a month later and she took me out just to know what time and brought me exactly back home and the due time. Now you might think it's very nice to have visits, but I can tell you it makes the departure hard. It was good for my spiritual setting but for my emotional setting, it was bad because every time I went through that separation again, you know, but I wouldn't tell her. I kept that for myself. So she said, oh, you're in time. All right, Maria next time can make a longer trip. Come in the morning. So she came in the morning and she said, where are we going to go? She said, why don't you go to Meersburg? Now, Meersburg, remember, is the place where I sang the song. I still wonder why she has sent us over there, you know, to get some emotion, I guess, I don't know. Anyhow, we went there. I took my aunt, we went to that vineyard where I had my last prayer with my mother. And there, what did we do? Study the watchtower, the one which was on the ban. She had brought them along. And we made Bible study the whole morning and noon. I, uh, I ate a lot of cookies which she had done and, uh, and things like that, you know. In the afternoon we studied again uh, another part of Bible prophecies. And we were supposed to take the boat at 5 o'clock. And at 4 o'clock I said to my aunt, I said, My, if they ask me what I have done with my day, what am I going to tell? We have been sitting here with the, with the vineyards all the, mo all the day. So my aunt said, all right, we go right away to the castle and visit the castle. But by the time we came to the castle, it was closed. 
so happily for us, in front of the castle they were sending carts. And my aunt bought 12 carts from the inside of the castle. And I studied those carts on the boat very thoroughly. She took the carts along. And Monday morning the teacher said, you give me a report of what you have done yesterday. And I went on giving all details about the castle which I had never visited, only through the cards. All the details, pages. Since I couldn't talk, I loved to write, you know. And when my aunt came back, the teacher said, well, Maria loves Germany. She loves German art. She has the feeling of the German Aryan history. So take her to another castle. Thought she did take me to another castle, and we did the same thing over. Getting pictures while studying the watchtower the whole day. So that's why I told you spiritually it did me some good to go on Bible reading and discussion with her. But when it came to departure, it took me almost a whole week to get again, uh, you know, even uh, my emotion, not the ups and downs which I had after her departure. So she, ga she brought me news and she told me that out of the 45 Jehovah Witnesses in my hometown, 35 had been arrested and put either prison or camps or, you know. And that Marcel Sutter, which had left before I was arrested, Marcel Sutter came home and said, I'm going to refuse military service by the Germans. I most probably will die. So we expected that, that he would die. And my aunt came and said, you know, Marcel is under death sentence. We don't know when he's going to be executed. But one day I was scrubbing the floor and the teacher came under the door and she said to me, remember Marcel, the boyfriend of your mother who replaced your father? Because he has come to my house to teach me, remember? She said, the boyfriend of your mother who has replaced your father, he has been beheaded. And she expected me to cry. And it was the opposite. I said, he kept faithful until death. And thereafter, when my aunt came once more, she got his last letter. And this last letter states the following. It says here, my dearly beloved parents and sisters, with an S, while well, he only had one sister. So he was thinking on my mother and myself. When you receive this letter, I will no longer be alive. Only a few hours separate me from my death. I ask you to be strong and courageous. Do not cry, for I have conquered. I have finished the course and kept the faith. May Jehovah God help me until the end. Only a short period of time separates us from the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. Soon we will see each other again in a better world of peace and righteousness. I rejoice as the thought of that day, since there will be no more sighing. How marvelous that will be. I am yearning for peace. During these last few hours I have been thinking of you and my heart is a little bitter at the thought of not being able to kiss you goodbye. But we must be patient. The time is near when Jehovah will vindicate his name and prove to all creation that he is the only true God. I now wish to dedicate my last few hours to him, so I will close this letter and say goodbye until we meet again soon. Praise be to our God, Jehovah, with my warm love and greetings, your beloved 
son and brother Marcel, 23 years old. So the op opposite had happened. Where was he beheaded? In Torgau near Berlin. And this strengthened my faith. But it was also the last time I saw my aunt, the last time I got news from my mother and from my father, because they could not write to me. From camp to camp, you cannot write. This is your Aunt Eugenie. Eugenie is her name. What is her family name? Walter. And she was the one that got the letters from father and from mother and would give news from one to the other in a secret way, of course. But this was the last time. This was in 44. Uh, last time she came was in 44. Uh, well, it was the cherry time. It must have been uh, July, June, July, something like that. Then afterwards, you know, well, it must be June because from the time on the uh, the American army came to France, the 18th of June, it was finished. There were, uh, she couldn't go on a train anymore. She didn't have any pass, and it was finished. She couldn't come. So I stayed without contact from June 43 until April 44. No news, not knowing whatsoever what my parents were, were you see. And it was also during that time that, that hard work of wood cutting and all that stuff came into action, you know. Well, in '44, lots of bombing went on, so I was trained as a nurse in case of uh, problems. And one day in '44, I was in the cellar. It was a time when we had to go up nights out of bed and dress and go down to the cellar because of the the, the bombers, you know, and then go up in be bed again and then get up again, my, sometimes two times, three times a night, you know, because they came over Switzerland and Constance is on the border, so they flew our, our heads over to Munich and so on, you see. And one day we were there, the morning, in the, in the underground, in the, a sort of a, a cellar, and I don't know. I had a feeling to go up. I never had disobedient. I was never disobedient, but the, uh, just such a push, you know, to go up. I went up, all with my uh, attire of uh, first aid, you know. And there came the teacher, the one who hated me so much. The one just to let you know how she was toward me. One Sunday she came along and she said, "I have some stockings." new ones which should be fortified. You had to to make some work underneath that they hold longer, you know. And I said, all right, I will do a pair. When I was finished, she gave me a wonderful apple, big one for the work. She said, but you have eaten today. I put the apple here on the shelf. You'll <coughs> get it later on. And she gave me the apple when it was rotten, completely rotten. But this is the way of things that went on between her and me, you see. So I, when I saw her with her gray hair, uh, eyes, foggy eyes, you know, I got scared. She stood there, me too. You know, we looked at each other almost like two dogs. We don't know what the other one is going to do, you see. And she said, Maria, your mother is here. And she opened the door. And there was sitting on the table a woman, a woman I did not recognize. Thin, worn out, who didn't go up, who did not greet, just looked at me. She had had an accident on the road. She had a crushed face with several kinds of colors on the face, you know, because they had nothing to uh, to clean up the wounds. So she had black and red and all kinds of and green, you know, how it is when you get hurt. Now, I was trained by the place. Whenever we were presented in front of a lady, just to bend over like that, go out, get our sewing, our knitting, 
our broderie and spread it on the table so the person may see what kind of work you do. So I went out, I got everything, I put it on the table, and I stood there stiff like that. My mother was on the other side. She looked at it, she didn't say a word. I didn't say a word. Then she turned around and she said to the teacher, can I take her with me? She said, no. She's here with a court case. I cannot let her go. I need the papers. She said, can I go and get the papers for her? Well, she said, you may try in the court case, you know. She said, Maria knows where it is because she has been in front of the, of the court, you know, for my second judgment the one I mentioned before, the one when they said they wanted to see how I was after five months of, uh, uh, you know, being in a house. And, and that occasion, which I did not tell you a while ago, they made the same talk. You could choose peace, uh, you know, go on with Germany or uh, choose a concentration camp. This time it was concentration camp, you see. Were you ever asked to sign? Yeah, that's it. The renunciation of your, so, of your faith? So he said, here on the table, he had the th thing on the table, he said, no. Uh, first of all, he said, you can sign your renunciation. I said, I won't. He said, all right, if you don't want to sign this one here, you sign this one on another table. And I don't know why I did that, but I did it. I saw the paper, I took the paper, and went with my paper on the other table. And that man screamed at me and said, that impossible person, the, uh, really, uh, 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 those people are really corrupted to the extreme. Why do you do that? I had no time to read what was underneath. But it was not the same document. So I figured out later on that the other one must have been the renunciation, just to have my father worked on and my parents, to show them, you see, she has renounced. There is no reason why he, he, he was so nice to me until I, uh, until I took the paper away from the table to sign it on the other table. And I just could see that the rest was not, not, not the same setting, you know. And he, he really got mad. He said, you see, you only deserve concentration camp. You don't deserve anything else, you know. When was that? When 43, was 43, November 43. That was six months after you started. That's right. And when, w was there ever another time where you were put in judgment to sign the renunciation? No, no, only this, this time. So the day mother came, they said, Simone knows the place. She has been there. You go, take Maria along. Okay. So we walked down to the court case. We didn't speak, she didn't speak, I didn't speak, you know. We came in the court case, and when we came there, the judges were gone. Everyone was fleeing in front of the army. So mother started off asking for my freedom. And when I saw this lady fighting to get me out of the place, I realized it was my mother. And I started off crying and crying and crying and crying. All the tears I had been holding back for two years, they just were flooding out. Did, you did not know, or did you know that was your mother when you first saw her? I couldn't answer that question because, uh, you know, when you have been in solitary confinement, as she had been, she had been once three months in solitary confinement because when she came to camp she was mending a bed cover and it wasn't finished when they took the bed cover away and they gave her a military cloth she said no I won't work for the army so they put her in solitary confinement and the chief commander Book was his name came and said, you won't get anything to eat and to drink until that jacket is mended. And mother told him, well, if you never have been 
stepping over a dead body of a woman, I will be the first one. I will not do it. The following day, he came back. Nothing was done. She hadn't eaten and drank anything. He said, you stupid woman. This jacket, once it's mended, it's going to be used for prisoners. Mother said, could have told me that before. I don't refuse to work for prisoners. Okay. The following day, the jacket was folded together on the floor, and Book came in, and he was all happy, because here he had her do the work. And he opened the jacket, and he turned mad, because Mother had taken everything away which made out of the jacket a military jacket, you know? The signs, the patches, the, and everything else. So I said, what have you done? She said, well, you told me it's for prisoners. Uh, do you give military cloth to your prisoner? You won't. So he left her in the solitary confinement for three months. Then she came out, and she had smuggled a Bible into the camp. Now, how did she do that? From the day on, the Gestapo said, we will arrest you. She made herself a girdle with a double pocket in there and a Bible and had it constantly on her and another girdle in top of it. And so when she came in a prison, she had to undress. And when they saw the double girl, she said, what's that? She said, oh, you know, stomach trouble. So I, ha I need to have something to hold my stomach. Oh, they said, we have no time to take the thing off. Okay, go in. And that's how the Bible got into the camp. And as soon as it was in the camp, she put it apart so it could circulate, you know, piecewise, not the whole, in case would catch. And she did Bible teaching. As a matter of fact, she helped the French president of the Red Cross, who almost decided to die, to sort of a suicide, you know. She helped her on getting the morals. She said, you don't let yourself go because you are a woman. They are almost animals the way they act. So you don't let yourself be pushed down. Stay up to what you are. So she could help that person, you know, to, to keep strong and survive. But the other girls to whom she taught the Bible somehow was a denunciation. And mother was put again in solitary confinement for four months. And the second solitary confinement was next to the Gestapo room where they had to cross interrogation, you know. And she heard screaming nights through. The blood came in her cell. And she stayed there for four months without seeing a person except the one who brought her the water or the soup. And one day, the door got open. A man was there, military cloth, the hall of science there, you know, with policemen with the guns in the hands. So she had to go up and say who she was and why she was in camp. So she said, be before she. The other ones started off laughing and said, Ha! Have you read the Jewish book? And she answered, Yes, Amiral, because she saw all that thing. And he started off laughing and said, Oh, I'm an Amiral. Have you seen that? I'm somebody in the army. And he ran off. A while later, the waiter came and said, You know, you escaped death because of your joke. She said, what joke? Well, he said, that was not an amiral. Didn't you recognize him? It was Himmler. But you know, he got flattered because she compared him to a, a amiral, you know? An amiral is a, I don't know if, you, uh, if it's the right word, the very high position for sea people. See? So he, he felt himself comfortable with that, you know? And the name of this camp that your mother saw? Schirmeck. That's Schirmeck in Alsace. When was this that Himmler visited uh, her? Well, it must have been uh, during 44, because she was moved uh, uh, in uh, September 44 to Gaginot on the other side of the Rhine River. In this camp that she told you about, 
What other kinds of prisoners were there besides Jehovah's Witnesses? Well, uh, resistance, French resistance a lot, you see. Yeah. Political, mostly of them. Was she able to, to be with just Jehovah's Witnesses? At the uh, yes, to a certain extent. When she came to Gaginot, uh, she was called to be uh, a maid at the SS place. And that woman, is, well, the lady, the, the, the wife of that SS, didn't give her even a glass of water, nothing. She had to take her food from the camp over to her place. And she was in the bombing section, you know. She uh, was bombed out about twice. When she told me she didn't want to go uh, in a safe place, she crossed the garden. And when the bombing went on, she made a hole in the ground, went in it, covered herself with the ground under the tomatoes or the beans. And then sulfur, burning sulfur came over the whole place. It went over her leg. But since she had a lots of ground on her leg, she got saved. And the ones who were underneath, they all were killed. So she went through a lot, you know. And she was completely exhausted. And a moment she couldn't get up anymore. And at a particular time, another witness had to replace her for mending in that SS place. And she would steal a carrot every day in a garden and saw this carrot in the leaf and bring this carrot to my mother. And another one had the possibility of getting a little bit milk. And with this carrot and the milk, mother got sufficient strength to get back on her feet. And they wanted to bring her over to Ravensbrück and had her walk and walk and walk and walk. And suddenly she got abandoned by the SS. So she went on a truck to get me. And the truck got bumped. And she was falling on the street and got her face crushed. Now it was in this condition my mother just came, you see. So she didn't have any normal reaction. Did you don't have any normal reaction after you went through all that, you see. Did your mother ever tell you that she was mistreated by the male SS? Was she? Uh, not know? further, no, no. Not more than the solitary confinement, you know. Not physically? Or? Not physically. Mother never physically. So, but she, she was emotionally, you know, crushed. No spontaneous feelings anymore. No, you know, too near death. And uh, on my side, everything was gone when the child stays two years without talking, except for the four or five times my aunt had come during those 22 months, you know. Your feelings somehow are not natural anymore. And we came over to home, over Switzerland, home. We found the place locked up, but it was in correct state. But when we came home, father was on the dead list. We were waiting for him, and suddenly it appeared on the race cross, Adolf Arnold, missing, dead. And one day, the barber's wife came, she rang the door, uh, the bell. I went opening the door. I said, Maria, what are you doing here? She never came in weekday, anyhow. She said, Simon, I'm not alone. Your father is here. And my father was, he couldn't make hardly the second floor. He was standing in between, trying to get his strength, you know. Well, I was 11 when he was gone. No, I was almost 15 when he came back. He didn't recognize me. He passed by. He went to his wife. And we wanted to talk to him. And he had lost his hearing from beating. He was deaf. He had been sent to Dachau, where he had got the typhus. And after that, one of the SS wanted him to be a painter for his personal interest. And in order to get him out, the other SS said to my father, here are boxes. You paint flowers on those boxes. But inside, 
was munition, bombs and things like that. And my father said, no, I do not lie, not even with a pencil, with drawing. I know what's in there, I won't do that. So they took him over to the, the place where they made research, uh, medical research. They put a fly uh, in a cage on his arm, eating him the blood every day to get him the malaria, the sickness. For the Rommel army who was in North Africa where the Germans had quite a few uh, sicknesses there, they got him on that because they thought he has had two weeks with typhus and fever and he survived. He must have something special in his blood. So they had him six weeks on that treatment. And after this was over, they sent him to Malthausen in a death commando. So he came there and he had to work in those 185 steps carrying those heavy stones, you know, from down up there. And one day he was seen by one of a purple triangle who came to repair electricity and he saw that my father was at the edge of dying. He couldn't walk anymore. So he got him out and brought him over to Ebensee. Now Ebensee was worse than Mauthausen, but he had a place for him in the washing where they washed. That man there in hot water, the whole day going around, you know, and it was a dog that was driving them. And one day my father got a commandment, he didn't hear it. He saw the dog coming, who was biting, uh, always there, you know, to kill persons. He just could escape, he was falling over on a step, and the SS put his foot on the step and the neck and crushed him the whole face. So that's why he had lost, definitely, his hearing. In Ebensee, it's a place where they had cannibalism. Father said he couldn't sleep anymore because people would eat themselves up, even still alive. It was an awful condition. The ration for eating, which was given in 43, was the same for one person in 43, for four persons in 44, and seven persons in 45. Almost nothing left. They had no shoes, they were barefooted in cold weather, and if when they did take something and put it around the feet, they could be hanged up because they were uh, not wearing shoes. You had to wear shoes or nothing, but not put anything on your feet. You know, things absolutely uh, demonized. So when he came home, he was a nervous wreck. He was like that. We had a hard time to talk, and we had a hard time to make a family again. You know, under those circumstances, it took us a hard time. But with our faith, we had a connection between us because we had the same feelings about our faith. And this brought us together again. But I can tell you, if this would not have happened, the family may have gotten apart. Because they have changed so much. The, the feelings have had changed so much, you know. Uh, we had a hard time to communicate. I remember one day we were standing on the street, all three of us, to cross the street. And after a while, my mother said, what are we doing here? Let's cross the street. We were expecting someone to say, go, halt. We were expecting the orders for weeks and months expecting orders. You know, go back and buy something, go back and act something. This was all strange. This was all uncommon. It took us a very, very long time to come to full appreciation of freedom. The freedom was not only the freedom of uh, the wires and, uh, and, you know, the camps and uh, that sort of thing. It was also to get rid of inside impact of that specific life, you know, where you had to take personal decisions afterwards. We had to grow up again, and we did. We were a very happy family afterwards. 
I was I left my parents for missionary work when I was 20. I came home when I was 15. I stayed with them. Uh, I went to school, art school afterwards, and worked with my father two years, and then I left. I came to New York, and I left. And when my mother got her heart attack, I took my parents with me, and we stayed together with Max. Max was a wonderful husband. He was taking care of my parents and wonderfully, you know, patiently. We lived all together in the same home for 17 years, took care of my mother, and then of my aunt who got senile. I took care of three years of her. She just left five years ago. So we spent 23 years afterwards taking care of our elderly parents, but in a happy life condition. So I can say that my feelings is that this Bible foundation is a rock as long as you stick to it. It is a rock. Talking about that for a moment, during your experience during the war, when you were talking with your parents afterwards, just at liberation, did you talk together about, were you able to observe the memorial? The, you know, was I there any? Did, I did observe the memorial the first year I was there. I, did, uh, I was able to count on a calendar the memorial, which is the same date as the Jewish memorial, of course. It is not with the Catholic Easter. It has nothing to do, because Easter is always on a Sunday. Well, the memorial, the full moon is not always on a Sunday. That moves around. Huh? It moves around the month and uh, also the days of the week. So I had gotten the first year this possibility because I had a calendar. But the second year they had taken the calendar away. So, of course, the second year I didn't have the possibility to have memorial. And my parents, it's the same thing. First year they had a contact with the outside. Afterwards I didn't even know which day they were in anymore. Father didn't know if it was May or April. They were anyhow in Ebensee they had snow until May. What about with other <coughs> Jehovah's Witnesses for your parents? Were they able to? Well, um, uh, Father was alone in Ebensee. The only Jehovah's Witness? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That he knew <coughs> of. Yeah, no, there was uh, also uh, no, there was uh, the electrician which I mentioned before. But he traveled a lot. Was see. your father's uniform with the uh, with the pit? He the didn't have it anymore. It was worn out, and he had just so no one knew he was Jehovah's Witness. No, <coughs> to about the end. No, excuse me. I think I have to drink a little bit. And your and your mother, when she was in her camp situations, did she have to wear a, a purple triangle? In the beginning, yes, but afterwards, were taken away. She had regular uh, old cloth. I mean, uh, because the bombing went on, they had nothing anymore. You know. It was all in pieces. It was the um, situation was uh, Germany in war, the war time, the last month in Germany uh, were terrible because of uh, hunger and lack of uh, sanitary condition and everything. The first years were with punishment very severe on Jehovah Witnesses. 1939. My husband has seen things with the witnesses, awful, you know. And still my father, as I told you before, when he was with typhus, just because he had a purple triangle, he felt fever. He went in there and asked the doctor, you know, I don't feel good. He had him take his own blood pressure, and he had no strength. And you know what the doctor did? The fist and the nose and all his teeth came out. It was a doctor. See? So they went through a lot, both of them. And just in the beginning, when they came, they just exchanged a few things, but they never talked about it. It was a time, it was just too much. We did not share our past. No, we didn't. Did there ever come a time when you did? No. We didn't. It's all through friends that I got to get all the information. And I've heard my father once telling that to outsiders, to friends, you know, and I was next to it. I could get that first testimony. What, what story was that that he well, heard? About heard? He, he mentioned another, the ones I just told you, you know. About the and typhus and uh, the, uh, yes, the malaria? Yes, and malaria testing. and uh, the stairs. And, and another one he repeated very often when he uh, went on Bible teaching. Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe in Christmas because 
Christmas uh, is not in the Bible. Jesus never said that you should have uh, honoring uh, his birth. Uh, birth honoring, as a matter of fact, has a pagan origin. So the Bible doesn't, you, you don't see any prophets having anniversaries, you see. So he said, over the same assess that wanted to him to have paintings done, he always uh, called on my father, you know. And he called on him for Christmas and he said, you sit next to me so I can drink and nobody sees what I'm drinking, otherwise they steal me the alcohol away. So he had the alcohol under the chair and he would drink. And there they were singing all the Catholic or Protestant Christmas songs, those SS. They had Jesus in a cradle there, and the tree, and everything. And once in a while they went out killing somebody, came blood stained in there, and continued singing Christmas songs. I'm telling you, when Christmas time came about, my father every year got down. I cannot stand the Christmas, the pagan atmosphere. I still see that bloodshed in concentration camp. Now this is a thing he would talk very often, you see. Another thing he, he mentioned very often, in Dachau were more than 4,000 Catholic and Protestant priests, you know, and he had a good contact with them. And the priest, they would say, you know, you witnesses, you are in camp because of the first commandment. We are in camp for the second commandment. The priest had a red triangle, political. Only Jehovah's Witness had a religious triangle, the purple. Because as a whole, they stand firm against Nazism as a whole while the Catholic Church or the Protestant individuals were against. But the top was not. The top was four, you see. They didn't even step in to liberate the ones who were in camp, you know. So those priests said, we are in because we gave a piece of bread to a prisoner. We were hiding a Jew. You know, things like that, which is very nice. But they said, you witnesses are there because you obey God rather than man. So this is the first commandment. And Father very often said that, you know, the priest in camp had high respect in front of the witnesses because they realized that their church didn't step in for them. And they were disappointed with their own religion because they were standing there knowing that uh, the Pope and all the big ones, you know, as Niemöller said, you know what Niemöller said? Niemöller was a very well-known pastor, Protestant. He said, when the communists were taken, I was not there. When other people in Germany were taken, I was not there. When the Jews were arrested, I was not there. And when I was arrested, nobody was there for me either. And when he came out from the camp, he mentioned Jehovah's Witnesses and he said, if we would have had that stand, many things wouldn't have happened in this country. And I think that's it. You know, when you think it over, only if only the religious people would have said, no, the first commandment and the second one doesn't allow you to go into war. They all claimed to be believers in those days. There were not so many atheists like today, you see. They all claimed to be believers. And yet they did not stand up toward it. So you cannot say God has forsaken his people. It's not true. It's the people who have forsaken God. That's why the things turn bad. Because if the people would have listened to God, God would have acted toward them like he did act toward us, like he did act to anybody who did right. But most of the people turned back on God because they didn't have sufficient information about the faith superficial faith, you know, the kind which doesn't sink in. And then when troubles come, well, that reminds me on, Jesus said once, when you build a house, build it on the rock, not on sand. Well, sand is nothing else but rock, 
in pieces, isn't it? If your faith is based only on light things, it won't stay. If it's on the rock and you leave it there, it's going to survive. And this is the story of uh, the stand firm of the witnesses, or do not fear, because there was not just a thing like f to have fear as long as you know you are in harmony with what the Bible says. So we got out stronger in faith to comparison of some others who have lost their faith because we have seen God in action. My father was called to the SS each time I would take a stand and he was made responsible for my education. Each time, whenever I went to, you know, the church or the Gestapo, uh, uh, the arrest and in Konstanz, he was called to the SS and he got the scolding or a beating because of me. I didn't know that, but he told us that afterwards. Your father told you? Yeah, but he said that made me happy because I knew you were standing firm. That gave me strength. I realized that Bible teaching is keeping you up, that you are not alone, you know. You have that strength in you. And I can tell that that's true. That strength, which is a strength which is different from stubbornness. It has nothing to do with stubbornness. It's just something that, well, it's well thought of. It's something uh, we cherish, our Bible knowledge and the feeling we have toward God. This is something heartwarming, strengthening. And that's why we went, as well Max as myself, in the missionary work. Because we were happy people, a happy childhood, and I don't feel bad about those days, you know. The days we passed was, like Mother said, a school for your adulterous life, and it has been. So, of course, we don't say that Hitler was a good thing. No, not at all. But the lesson we got out of it has strengthened our faith. Clarify or verify the, the penitentiary center when you left Konstanz. It was the spring of 45, and your mother came to the camp. Mm -hmm. You didn't recognize her. And at what point did you finally realize it was her? Well, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, she tried to get those papers because uh, I was in that place with a court case. And when she arrived uh, at the place, uh, the judges were all gone, and of course a secretary uh, could not do legal papers. And she was fighting very hard. She tried to, to get their, their emotions and everything, and it didn't work. But when I heard my mother talking and fighting for my freedom, I, I found my mother back, you see. I got her temperament back, her love, and everything got back. But we did not have the papers. So when we came home, I had to stay in the home, and she had to go to a refugee camp. And that went on for a few days, but I could not recall how long. In daytime, she would come to the house, but she had no right to see me. And afterwards, I heard that she even stepped in to do some work in the house I was, to help them out. They, they had little, uh, what do you call, not sheep, uh, uh, goats and w uh, a she-goat. You say that, a she-goat? I think so, huh? Female goat. Uh, well, uh, and she had little babies, and she couldn't give birth, and my mother was helping that she-goat to give birth, to take the, uh, the baby goat out of her. So uh, she got some kind of respect. Now, the problem was, uh, Konstanz is on uh, uh, a piece of land between the lake who departs in two parts in the north, you see? And it is on the end where the Rhine River goes out from the big sea into the lower sea. And they did not know if the Americans or the British or the French would come down this way. 
But as soon as they realized that the French army was stepping into that land there between the lakes and heading for Constance, they threw us out. Because they said, she's the only French girl in the house, and we might get in trouble with the French army, so let her go over the border. So we, the Swiss were accepting in those days refugees. They had a refugee camp, you know. We passed that refugee camp, and when we came in there, we had to undress completely naked, like, a, like in a camp, you know. And for the first time as in my life, I saw my mother naked, and on top of it, you know, thin. The, the skin of her uh, tummy was hanging over the knees. Uh, you know, completely empty, dried out completely. This was my greatest shock just right after the war to see my mother in this condition, you know. So we had to go to cleaning and uh, disinfection and, and so on, and our, our clothes had to go to a disinfection, and then we got on the train and we were brought to the western border of Switzerland. So there was happiness to be with each other, but I mean, it wasn't the happiness you would have uh, free of all emotions because you still had in you, you know, the load of your own bodies, worn out, hungry, thirsty, used to be ordered around, getting orders. We just were not completely free. It took time. When we came home, uh, the SS had closed the apartment because they wanted to have uh, uh, people from the Gestapo in our apartment. And the factory had closed it because it belonged to the factory. So we had the chance to find everything when we came home, which was not true for all the parties. Some of them have lost everything. But we haven't lost anything. Everything was just there, you know. As a matter of fact, our road was uh, a place where they had six weeks fighting going on between the French and the Germans. And all the apartments were open. The windows, the doors, and everything open so the police could go through. But since ours were closed, you know, by seals from the government, we didn't have lost anything. Everybody else had things stolen from this period of time, you know. So it turned up to our advantage. And when father came home, no, father is another story. When, Eben, when the American came to Ebensee, they had learned that some of the prisoners were supposed to be in a tunnel to be exploded. So they had to search for the prisoners in Ebensee. That's why it took so long. And when they found those prisoners, they couldn't walk anymore. And my father was among them. So they kept them in a place to nourish them with rice and milk to get them back to strength. And afterwards, my father had to make his own way back to France. He had no transport anymore. The Red Cross was gone, you know. He, he came over the border a long time afterwards. As a matter of fact, he came home two days before Pentecost, which was in June, long time after the war had ended, you know. The war ended in, in, the, in May, beginning of May. He came home about five weeks later. So when he passed by with the train, he saw our house. So he knew we were home. Well, he knew. The apartment was standing there. It was not bombed. The city was bombed. And then he went right away to the barber shop. And there he heard that we had come home. So father knew when he came home that we were there. So he sort of released, you know, to know that his wife and his child has come back. But as I told you, he, he, he couldn't work uh, all I think it was 15 months before he could start off working again, you know. And he was too shaky, you know, with drawing pictures. That was not possible. He went like that. His first picture he, he did was in 1947. He calmed down with the shaking, you know, and could go back on more regular work, I should say. Does that answer your question? Tells. What did you want to do? Well, I had in mind to be a missionary, but uh, my father believed I should get trained. 
and I refused to go back to school because I had no schooling between 1941, age 11, and 1945, age 15. So I would have had to go to school with children 10 years old while I was 16. And I just couldn't f make it, you know. So that girl I mentioned before that stopped saying Heil Hitler, uh, she had gone through school regularly. And she was in a professional school. And she would bring me some homework home. So I continued to study on homework. And then the state, the French state, gave the possibility of going to art school by competition on drawing, not on exams, you see. So I went on competition and I was accepted in that school. So I did two years of schooling, and I would have gone to Paris in the, uh, in the Beaux-Arts in Paris. But I was heading for missionary work, and I thought it was sufficient to have those two years, which gave me the principle of printing material and how to handle, you know, uh, drawings and paintings for printing scarves or material, you know, uh, for curtains or for do dresses. You, do you regret not going to Beaux Arts? Uh, no, I don't. I don't absolutely not because, uh, you know, I have been raised with a father who, who was a very uh, good artist. As a matter of fact, some of his work are in a museum in France, in Mulhouse, in. Uh, uh, Musée de l'Imprimerie, this is uh, the printing uh, museum. And he has been a, a complete artist, and he has given me a lot of uh, counsel already as a little child, you know, and afterwards too. And there was a time I didn't do too much painting because, um, well, I, I went behind English and then uh, went to Algiers as missionary and then sent back to France and you know, uh, life took over, uh, lots of work. And finally, it's those latest years, I'm going back again on aquarelle and, and acrylic and do again some paintings, you see, presently. I catch up to give something to my friends, which I had never, never done before. I say I better do, give them a souvenir, as long as my eyes are good, as long as my hand don't are too shaky, you know, I'm getting older. and. Sometimes I feel my hand is not as straight as it should be, so I better get my work off a little bit and make my friends happy. So I'm doing some artwork just right now. Has your, has your experiences during the war influenced your artwork? Not at all. Absolutely not. No. Absolutely not. I'm specialized in flowers and, uh, and scenery, snow especially. Uh, yes, snow and uh, the lake. I work a lot on our lake, you know. So, no, no, we have been, my father and myself, on, on a rather peaceful, not modern painting, not aggressive, peaceful, the one, you know, that helps you to dream, not the one that gets you excited. Electrifying painting is not our feelings, you know, just... Uh, classical painting, try to, to get an atmosphere, something not too close on, uh, on photography either, you know, which is an art for itself, something uh, in between photography and uh, Renoir, you know, in between. The Renoir colors are our setting we always liked. Don't like hard contrasts. How did you how did you meet your husband? Well, uh, my father had uh, asked me to learn English, and uh, if I did speak a certain English, I could come to the international convention in 1950 to New York, and that's what I did. I was then 20 years old, and I crossed the ocean with uh, Ile de France. And I came over here, and I stayed in East Manhattan in 31st Street. And I did some uh, rooming work for the convention for the Watchtower Society while How large here. was the society then in New York? 
Well, we uh, I remember of three congregations, East Manhattan, West Manhattan Center, and Bronx. Uh, maybe there were another one. Uh, I don't know, but those are the three I, where I went, you see. And I saw Max the first time at a friend's place. He was invited at the same time as myself. But it was a time I didn't think of marriage, and he didn't either. So uh, we just met, that's all. Then I came back in 1952 for the missionary school of Gilead in Upper uh, New York State in Ithaca. And I saw Max again, and we talked together, but nothing has happened, you know. We still didn't believe in marriage. I came back in 53 at the convention, international convention, representing Algeria, because as missionary I had been gone there, but the war broke out, so I had to go back to France. And they sent me back to Paris where I stayed for 10 years. And then finally, in, in 56, 55, Max came over to Paris on a convention, and that changed our situation. That's where we got engaged in Nuremberg, where we had 117,000 witnesses at the same place where Hitler used to have his parades. And that's where we were making our lives as being one goal. That's it. Was there a hope for family? Well, we did not work for it. Uh, we didn't. We didn't work against it, but we didn't work for for it either, because uh, we had the missionary work in mind, and we had seen a lots of things for children. You know, uh, we felt um, there's a time for things and a time to say no. And as I said, we did not work against it. I mean, we didn't. <coughs> We use Bible principles in our life, but they didn't come. So we are happy because we have many spiritual children. We have been able to help over a hundred of persons, as a matter of fact, more almost 200, <coughs> to get knowledge of the Bible. How has your experience during the war helped other other people, and what do you, what kind of advice do you give to people, other witnesses or anyone who asks you? Well, I would say that it is not a matter of personal strength. I was a weak child, like any child, had ups and downs, like everyone. And I never felt as being a hero. I would like to get this out of uh, sight, you know. I have the conviction when God sees in somebody a determination to keep up with Bible principles and put his life for, put the life into it until death if necessary. It is God that gives the strength to do it. Now, Conscience comes in there, because conscience, a, a good conscience, makes you happy, as long as you have one, of course, because there are means and ways to kill a conscience of a person, you know? When a person goes on a certain program, it goes down, 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 until it has no conscience anymore. But I'm speaking of a person who has a conscience and works on it and wants to be in peace with it, its own inside this person will be happy if it succeeds in the determination to be in peace. So that's a uh, teaching my father would repeat that I was a very child. He always said, you don't do anything uh, willingly which you would regret afterwards. If you are not sure about something, don't do it. Do it if you are sure, or stay away from it, because a bad conscience messes you up, and for sure. I'm happy about what has happened, you know, I don't feel sorry. I wouldn't like that anybody else would go through it. That's not the way, you know, uh, to be a martyr. That, that's not the point at all. But uh, to look back and see that, you know, you can say, well, if the same situation would come up, I would do the same thing, because that's what made me feel good in my conscience. 
This is what I would say. A person has to live up to what the conscience. Now, my conscience has been trained by the Bible. Somebody else's might be trained by something else. This is a personal and private question. But for me, living in harmony with a Bible-trained conscience has more value than any money or anything else. I could have made a very big career with painting. As a matter of fact, after two years, I was the only one taken out of school who had an offer to go working. A very brilliant career, but I decided that by to help people to get consolation, to get hope, to get out of that uh, pressure of this uh, kind of life who ends up to with death. To get them out of that and give them a hope to live is more important than money. And I still have that same feeling. I'm over 66 years old now, and I still feel the same way. That's why I like to share our experience, because it has brought to us another kind of value, which for us is greater than gold and silver. We don't push it on people. People can choose. We believe in freedom of choice. We wanted to have that freedom for us, and we feel that everybody is free to choose the means of life they want. But we have the right to offer what we have felt being a blessing to us, and that's what we feel. Well, I, I thank you very much. You're welcome. Mrs. Liebster, your story will be heard. Well, I hope it's going Learn. to help pe persons to see that you can have a source of strength which is really the strength which is above anything else. We'll bring your husband out now. You two can okay. talk together. Okay. Now here's Max, the man I talked about just a while ago who took so good care of my parents. I was we, happy to do it. <laughs> I know you were. Yeah. We have had a... Very, very, uh, very worth uh, while to do to do all efforts for them, for their faithfulness, for their devotion, and for their good works. Their I lives. still remember when I brought uh, um, my first picture over from the States. Mother wanted to know who was that man on that picture, on the famous little picture there. Mm -hmm. And when I said he is a Jewish Jehovah Witness, she said, does he still have family? I said, well, uh, he has lost his father, and he has no one in Europe anymore. And so my little mother had a big heart for the Jews. Already before the war, she loved them. And she was sending a package with sweets. And you got the idea that I was behind, and it was <laughs> not true. <laughs> but six years later, something went into my heart, and as a young child, I used to say, if my husband could be a Jew and a Jew a witness, that would be a gift of God. And it happened. I got my Jew oh. <laughs> as a witness. No, she, well, my mother was responsible for <laughs> that idea, you know. Uh, we met already in 1950 here in this building in the plenary, and we were invited and we came together. And I said, she has the same experience. Her parents had been in concentration camp, <laughs> Please. and Thank the you. mother and all were faithful and, and uh, had only one thing in mind, to please uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They have lots of appreciation of the Jewish people which had the privilege to write the Bible. And for us, the Bible is uh, the highest gift that the people can have. And this gift gives her a good direction. Mr. Liebster, your wife was telling me before mm -hmm. that after the war, it was hard for her to talk with her parents about her experiences. Mm -hmm. Together for, for all these years, has it been difficult? Or what has it been like for you to both being survivors in well, different ways? I guess we both of us have, uh, I wouldn't say forgotten, because you cannot forget the things like that. But it wasn't on our mind anymore. 
uh, we had goals, spiritual goals that made us happy. And uh, responsibilities. So, you know, I, I would say it was like a, a scenery which disappears in fog. It's still there. You can feel still what's going on, but it gets foggy. It doesn't hurt so badly. It has come up those latest years when uh, people would say it did not happen. And we felt that we have to speak up for the living and for the dead. We had to keep that memory back, you know. But it took time. Uh, this, this was now between 45 and 1980, uh, 1990, I should say. We didn't hardly speak about the matter. Once in a while it would come up, you know. But uh, uh, it, it was not on our mind because uh, uh, our life was so rich with spiritual happenings, you know, and visiting conventions and uh, seeing friends. And, you know, Jehovah Witnesses have a worldwide brotherhood, which is something outstanding. Wherever we go, we feel at home. Uh, mm -hmm. And we feel like the other ones are our sisters, our brothers, uh, in a very uh, uh, close, close relationship, relationship yeah. you know. Uh, there is only one word for it, the philia. The philia, this is the love of being close to one another. And that's how we felt. So we didn't get that emptiness uh, many of the deportees have gotten after the depression. war, you know, depression. Uh, we did not get through that. Well, uh, the health has had some trouble, for sure. Health problems went on with the parents and everything. But uh, every... Uh, when, once in a while, when we would go to the doctor for one of the parents or for ourselves, they all always said the same thing. They said it's hard to believe that you went through that experience because it doesn't show up. But it doesn't show up because our wonderful work has helped, helped to heal all that, you it know. 100% satisfaction. So we had a happy life in spite yes, of everything. Yes, what about living in France? It's no difference. Uh, For no you. No difference where we are. Well, we, we have the same activity, the same spirit, the same Bible, the same congregations. And we are busy with, with the congregation. There are three meetings every week yeah, that keeps us busy. to prepare before I give public talks everywhere. I have uh, families to teach. And you, you are so uh, occupied with the people. You right. forget yourself. What about... French people who, who were not, did not stand by you during the war, or German people? That's an interesting question you bring to the fourth. Um, remember when I uh, talked to you about my mother and uh, the policeman looking out the window and saying, uh, you know, uh, many dogs hunting an animal in the forest, okay? After the war, uh, it happened that my mother was called by the French police, and they said, you know, we found your denunciators. You just have to sign up, give your signature, and we will arrest them and put them in prison. So mother said, I never will do a thing like that because I'm not the one who is going to retaliate bad with bad. God is the only one who has a right, the right to retaliate. But I would love to see who it was. So the first one on the list was the Catholic priest. The second one on the list was a Protestant one. And the third one on the list was a person in the house where we lived. Shall now, this lady, which was strong Catholic, who was the one behind and said, uh, how long is she going to be in liberty? The husband is gone, the girl is gone, and she still runs in liberty. You know, this very lady got cancer. And in those years, there was not much hope for people who had cancer. She had them in the bowels, you know. And she got treatments which did not give her much rest with pains. You know, my mother, over one year, went every day to wash her up, to make her bed, helping her until she died. That woman used to say, my Catholic Church has abandoned me. It has to be one of Jehovah's Witnesses who cleans me. Not cleaning, you know, when uh, everything goes away from your body is not an easy thing. But Mother, mother knew that being a Christian 
means to live according to the example given. And there is no room for a Christian to have hatred. This does not fit into a Christian's life. What was the name of the woman that, that your mother... Egerman. Egerman was the name of the woman. Was it, and her first name? I don't recall. No. no. The Bible says you shouldn't pay back bad for bad. And se seven times, 70 times you should forgive yeah. every day. And 490 times by day. Uh, there is no problem, no dispute, uh, no uh, uh, difficulties. That's uh, why we get along together. so well, you see. <laughs> he forgives me seven times, 70 times per day. I can make a lot of mistakes. times <laughs> a day. Well, thank you both so much for coming on camera. Thank you. No, thank you for, okay. for coming on your wife's testimony. And thank you again, <laughs> Madame Liebster, Monsieur Liebster. <laughs> this is Simon Lip uh, Arnold before I was Lipsch, of course. Uh, this was taken after the arrest of my father. My father was arrested for September 1941, and shortly afterwards I need to have I, I, an identification card to go to school. And so this was taken at that time, and it appeared on my identification card. That is why you see on the bottom there uh, still the, the place where it has been fixed to the card. You see? Way in the bottom over there. And this was in, taken in Mulhouse? It was taken uh, in Mulhouse, yes. 1940? Uh, uh, in the winter 1941, 42. And the, you, the, the shirt you're wearing you made yourself? Uh, yes, uh, that's my first knitting work I had done. My mother had learned me to knit very early in my life, and I was supposed to knit something for my doll. And after I had made a little piece of it, I thought it was too much work to work for the doll. I have worked for myself. And how did you get this photo? After the war? Uh, on the identification card. Just plain, you know. It's the only one I had. Who is in this photo? It is me again, Simone, and uh, this was taken after the judgment uh, by the court was made that I should go to a penitentiary home. Uh, somebody had told us the approximate period of time when that would happen, so my mother thought it would be time to get a picture done by a photograph, a regular picture, as a souvenir. So this uh, picture was taken toward the end of May in Mulhouse, and uh, it was the way I looked at the moment of the time I had to go to Constance and I arrest just a few days before. You see. Spring of 43, was it? Yes, it's 43, yes, uh -huh, 1943. Mm -hmm. Who's in this photo? Now, this is a reunion of the Arnold family. Uh, my mother is to the right, and uh, in, in May, June, it's June 45, she was out of camp for approximately six weeks. As I have told before, uh, I came out at the same time, so I'm, I'm f 15 years old there. And my father had just come home four days when this picture was taken. Uh, he had been a uh, few days in Ebensee, uh, in Bad Ischl, exactly, in an American camp to get food and got back on his feet. So uh, you can still see uh, the way his face is very thin. And as a matter of fact, when he came back from camp, he only had 43 kilos. When he had left, he had 72. So this is our first picture of the reunion. Who's in this photo? In this photo, you will find uh, my classmates, of course, and myself in the Bible School of uh, Gilead, uh, training missionaries from all over the world. And I'm located in the third row in the center with the brights on my head. 
Uh, this was just before uh, our schooling term was over. I was then 22 years old. This is taken in Gilead, New in York? In Ithaca, yes. Upper State, New York, Ithaca. South Lansing, exactly. Mm -hmm. Who is in this photo? This is a group of uh, Purple Triangle people. It was uh, taken at the 50th anniversary of liberation in Paris. We had a souvenir meeting there. Uh, those are people coming from Germany, Holland, Belgium, France, of course, and Austria, and Poland. And uh, we had a meeting there. As it is said, memory of witnesses, memoire de témoins, and if you have a close look on the picture, you will find, uh, find Max in the second row next to me uh, in a wine red coat uh, because we are a member of the CIJAT. The CIJAT is the European Association of Former Deportees. This is Cercle Européen des Témoins de Jéhovah, Anciens Deportés. And we come together once in a while. We have publishing material and uh, exhibitions going on in Europe. And we have been invited to Tampa uh, with our exhibition as well as to New Orleans. So we are very active with this group of survivors because we believe that the memory of the witnesses has to keep alive. Who's in this photo? Madame Liebster, this photo? This photo um, has a background, an historical background. First of all, uh, we had uh, the visit at home uh, from a um, person who was getting uh, testimonies for the Washington Museum and told me that it would be good when Jehovah Witnesses had an exhibition to have a painting there showing how my husband has had his life saved in a specific way. So he knew I was doing some painting and he gave me the idea I should submit a painting for that particular day. No, I haven't, I had not seen uh, the place where Max had been. Uh, so it was only according to his sayings. I knew there was a wooden pile. We had a discussion on that wooden pile and he thought it must have been wood that was used uh, to, to get the tracks of the train, you know. That's why the wood over here is different from the reality, because that's the idea he had. He, you know, he himself at that precise moment did not realize why, what kind of wood there would be, and he thought it may have been uh, woods for the train tracks. So I got the information from him and I painted this, showing Max and Mr. Icon. They went on that extermination train in April, that was when Buchenwald was uh, liberated by the Americans. This was just the day before. The Jews had to go to the woods and dig their graves to be shot, you know. And uh, there was a lot of crying going on there. And then suddenly um, it happened they had a Bible text there, and they said, let's go aside and have a prayer before and a reading, a Bible reading. So they got behind that wooden pile, and they got forgotten by the SS who were in a hurry to exterminate the train. So that's how they got liberated. And that's why uh, Mr. Buckley, who was working for the Washington Museum, thought I should get this on a, on a painting for that specific day. So it's an acrylic painting. It is not the type of painting I usually do. Uh, this is an exception, but it was specifically done for that day. Where is the painting now? Well, uh, Mr. Berkeley has taken it back because it's his property. And I couldn't tell you exactly where it is. It's in America somewhere. What year did you paint this? I painted it in 92, I think it was. So it cannot stay in the museum because in the museum they only uh, accept paintings which have been done in camp, not after camp, of course. It's normal. It's not. It's not a, 
uh, museum for painting. This was for a specific purpose, you see, and it might be used in future time. It must be somewhere. My friends have it. Um, so I don't care where it is. And presently, I know it's in a good place. Thank you. And this photo? This photo shows the stage of uh, our Kingdom Hall, where we have our Bible teaching done in Aix-les-Bains. Uh, they asked me if I could do a wall painting. What you see here is not quite half of the place I painted. It, it, it goes further to the left. So it shows uh, to the right the scenery we have behind our lake. Uh, those mountains uh, uh, are called the pre-Alps, the true Alps are a little bit further away. And uh, they wanted to have uh, this painted, you know, to give uh, a feeling of sitting outside and not be crushed over by uh, the walls. So I made that work. And uh, you can see uh, the dark stripe which is on the floor is the end of the stage. The rest is painted. The pink, which is uh, slightly lighter in the back, there starts the painting. What year did you paint this? Well, I have been working on it until uh, this summer. As a matter of fact, I still have a little bit to go uh, in a certain corner because I have been uh, very active with uh, the Sijat, that is, with the exhibitions going on, traveling in 22 cities and going to Berlin and Switzerland and now America. So I had to work, uh, you know, uh, one by one. And we made a nice arrangement. When we c would come home uh, from our work, teaching work, I would put my food on the stove and my husband would look over the food. And during that noon hour, I would come over here and paint. And when I came home, I could sit under the table because it was cooked. So he has a share in this painting, you see. It's very long. It has 15 meter width and five meter height. So you only have a little part here. Yes, it's almost a man's work. <laughs> I was on the ladder all the way up. And then we have, we have windows in the ceiling on the top, you know, and I went up there. Uh, our sky goes up there and goes out into the true sky. So it was quite a work, but I enjoyed it. Wonderful. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. Now this is the outside of the place. You have seen uh, the painting inside. And you c can see those mountains in the back. They look already more like the Alps, a little bit different from what you have seen on the painting, because uh, the painting has the mountains before those. Uh, which are soft mountains, uh, round mountains, while here you already get, you know, the, the steep of the rocks and everything. And I didn't want to bring this into the Kingdom Hall because uh, it is a wall that comes toward your face and this is not a happy thing to look at, you know. I prefer the round uh, valley, you know, the soft one, uh, because it's more relaxing, it's tender, uh, and uh, you feel like, uh, you know, being... Uh, in the air, not close in, while this kind of mountain closes you in, you know. Some people feel uh, uncomfortable when they are tied in in mountains. The other is much better. Is this kingdom, the kingdom hall you have here, the original site since when you first joined it? No, not at all. Uh, we, uh, when we came in Aix, nobody was there, so we started off uh, teaching. And then we first had a, a little room in a, in a place given by the town people. Then uh, finally we got uh, uh, a, rental, a rental place, you know, and then uh, we got on the decision to build because uh, uh, on Passover day we have more than 300 people coming in there, you see, so we needed a bigger place. When was this place uh, open or constructed? Well, it must be uh, nine years ago now, and because uh, this stage painting has been redone. We had a problem with heating system and we had to redo the heating system and so they changed also uh, the inside. We used to have a curtain before and they want to get rid of the curtain and so they got on the painting and that's why the painting has been done inside, you see. So this is a late work, last two years. 
but uh, the outside is exactly the same like from the very beginning. Thank you very much, You're Mrs. Welcome. Sleepster.